America's youth in terms of education, health, and living environment. Next, the selection of the Irish Prime Minister, known as the Taoiseach, from last Thursday's meeting of the Irish Doyle in Dublin. At the beginning of the session, members chose the Speaker of the Doyle and then discussed the future Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern. The session lasts about an hour and 45 minutes. Clear Condolas, Green Ushla. It gives me great pleasure to propose the name of Seamus Patterson as a candidate for the office of Keon Corla. Although he's only 61 years of age, Seamus is the longest serving member of this House and one of its most distinguished. He was first nominated to contest a Doyle election at the age of 23 and fought that contest, which was a by election in 1960. His father, James, had been a long serving member of the Doyle, representing the people of his constituency for a total of 21 years. From the moment of his own election in 1961 until today, Seamus Patterson has had an unbroken and unrivaled career of public service. He is respected and admired on all sides of the House, and especially so by the people of Carlow Kilkenny, whom he has served faithfully and diligently for the past 36 years. He has served them as a member of the Doyle, and has three terms as Mayor of Kilkenny City, and two as Chairman of County Kilkenny County Council. When Seamus Patterson first walked into this chamber, Sean Lamass was Taoiseach. Many of the founding fathers of this state, men like Dan Breen, Sean McEntee, Sean McKeown, James Dillon and Frank Aiken were here at that time. The leader of his own party was Brendan Corish, who had just the previous year taken over from Bill Norton. In the years that have intervened since, a great deal has changed. Personalities have come and gone. History has been made many times over. And through it all, Seamus Patterson has been a loyal servant of the people and a proud member of this democratic assembly. He has also served in government as Minister of State in the Department of Social Welfare from 1983 to 1987 and in the European Parliament, where he was Vice Chairman of the Parliament's Committee on Social Affairs and Employment. In the last Dáil, he was a particularly effective Chair of the Select Dáil Committee on Social Affairs. In short, Seamus Patterson has served an illustrious apprenticeship for the position of Ceann Corla. I have no doubt whatsoever that he will, but that he will grace that office if selected by this House today. Those of us who know him and have worked with him can tell the House that he is one of its most fair-minded members, a person who will see his first and last duty has been to advance the interests of members and to protect their rights. We also know, and I, suppo I suppose I offer this as a warning to this House, that beneath Seamus's mild exterior, there is a strong and resilient character, uh, the person of absolute integrity and determination. People who have underestimated him before, and they have done so at their own peril. I believe that Seamus Patterson will add luster to the list of people who have held the important and prestigious office of Count Corla, and I have no hesitation whatsoever in commending his appointment to this House. Uh, Clark of the Dáil, I am very pleased to second the proposal uh, to be Can Cure the name of Seamus Patterson. I do so in full knowledge of the long record of service which both he and his family have given to the country, to the constituency and here in Dáil Éireann. And to have survived 12 general elections, to have survived 36 years in Dáil Éireann is a record in itself. And I think the common sense he has garnered over those years, the faith and trust put by the electorate in him and he and them would stand this Dáil in good stead. I um, am pleased, as I said, to second the proposal of Seamus Patterson to be Can Curia. Osrode Nakwil Ak Anamikan Awan on Kurit Mayam Kesht Inish. As there's only one nomination, I shall now put the question. Tommy Corona Kesht got over on Talk to Shams Mac 14, Ags Gorakic Shay again as Nadal and Ish Mark Young Corla. I am putting into question that Deputy Seamus Patterson be elected and do now take the chair of Nadal as Count Corla. And with Ontario Kit Ainta, is the motion agreed? Eriminish er on Talk to Seamus Mac 14, called the Dodd Down Counter, Cahara Kilkenig, Dodd again as an Octo Dodd as I now call on Deputy Seamus Patterson, member for the constituency of Cahara Kilkenig.
But what lum of weakers we go all live, as me a howet mark young corla doll air in you. Is more on an or dumb say, there him live go lair go near for me, my yeehel, corporal and a fain a hort the gock illa chocta and shaw. Agus iramud orshiv, kauru lumsa, con dulgish na huffigish shaw, a colina maris core. Fellow deputies, I would like to thank you, the members of this house, for the great honour you have conferred upon me in electing me Cian Corla today. I wish most sincerely to convey to all deputies and the various parties which comprise this great democratic assembly my profound gratitude for the confidence you have reposed in me. I assure you all that I will strive earnestly to prove worthy of this great honour now conferred upon me. As my proposer has said, I've been a member of this house since 1961 and have long since valued highly the history and the traditions of the house. In keeping with the traditions of my illustrious predecessors, I will endeavour to preserve and uphold the dignity and decorum of this house at all times. As Cian Corla, I see it as my task and duty to administer and apply the rules of this house as laid down by this house with utter impartiality, fairness and equality between parties and between deputies. My aim will be to carry out the work of the chair in such a manner as to give full expression to all members, consistent with our standing orders and the due business of the House before us. I realise it is impossible to carry out the work of this House without the full cooperation of all members, and because of this I now humbly seek that, cooper that cooperation. I trust and indeed feel sure this cooperation will be readily forthcoming at all times from all sides of the House. In seeking to uphold the best traditions of this House, I am mindful of my many illustrious predecessors. It would be remiss of me if I did not mention in particular my immediate predecessor, former Deputy Sean Tracy. As outgoing Count Corla, he will be remembered by all for the invaluable contribution he made in upholding the dignity and the decorum of this house. And I'm very glad... <laughs> and we're all very glad to see him present here today in the Distinguished Visitors Gallery. I must now turn to perform my first official duty as Count Corla. In accordance with our Standing Order No. 8 of the Standing Orders relative to public business, I wish to make the following declaration. I do solemnly declare that I will duly and faithfully and to the best of my knowledge and ability execute the office of Count Corl of Dáil Éireann without fear or favour, apply the rules as laid down by this House in an impartial and fair manner, maintain order and uphold the rights and privileges of members in accordance with the, constitution, with the Constitution and the Standing Orders of Dáil Éireann. Mar ochel scór tám é fyrfríachtíocht, agus gúim ráthé orf gólair san dál nú a sá. Deputy Hogan. Uh, I count Corla. Uh, members, I'm very pleased as a fellow Kilkenny man to congratulate you, uh, Account Corla, Deputy Patterson, on your election here today. As a fellow Kilkenny member of Parliament and as somebody I have served with you at local and national level for the past number of years, I can always say that you are a good friend of mine, are still a good friend of mine, and that we cooperated extremely well together at local and national level in the interests of the constituents of Carlow Kilkenny. As this tarnished uh, in proposing you as stated, the Patterson name has been synonymous with Labour Party and politics in Kilkenny since 1932. And there's no fitting uh, tribute that I can pay to you except to say that the people of Carlow Kilkenny have expressed their wish for, to you and to the Patterson name to be in this Parliament since 1932 except for a brief interlude. 
1957 to 1961. But I want to wish you well, sir, and you can be assured that you are, I bring with you, and the fellow deputies from Carlo Kilkenny, I express to you our deepest and, and sincere congratulations on your elevation to this important constitutional office, and I have no doubt that you will do an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. The next business is item four, nomination of Taoiseach, and I will now receive motions. Count Corla. Uh, Count Corla. Yeah, Deputy Spring. I beg your pardon. I'm tarnished, uh, Deputy Spring. Thank you, Count Corla. Uh, Count Corla, I rise uh, to propose the name of the outgoing Taoiseach, Deputy John Bruton, for the office of Taoiseach in this doyle. I do so because I was honoured to serve as Deputy Bruton's Tonishta for the past two and a half years, and I have no doubt whatsoever that he is fitted for the post. He led a good government well, and in court his courtesy, competence and efficiency will be part of an enduring legacy. My party will be voting for Deputy Bruton today because he has already proved himself able for the highest executive office in this land. And I say that without any disrespect of whatsoever for Deputy Hearn, whom I will be among the first to congratulate should he win this contest. Deputy John Bruton has been an outstanding Taoiseach. His contribution to policy in relation to Northern Ireland will stand the test of time. And indeed, it is a mark of the man that right up to yesterday, he has worked to sow the seeds of an inclusive peace and a fair settlement. His work in Europe will be remembered for a long time. The success of the Irish presidency in the second half of last year was due in no small measure to his patience and skill and to the respect he has earned on the international stage. Perhaps above all, he welded together a team of strong individuals into a coherent and cohesive unit to provide two and a half years of the most effective government this country has seen. The strength of the economy that we are handing over the rebuilding of good and efficient social services, the decent balance that has been struck between the needs of a compassionate society on the one hand and the legitimate demands of taxpayers on the other, the investment in education, training and skill, the turning of the corner in the battle against crime. All of these things and more are testament to an outstandingly successful Taoiseach. My nomination of Deputy Bruton as Taoiseach, I suppose, is my last act as a member of the Rainbow Government. Not my last act, I can assure you. We now, in all probability, go into opposition, but we can do so as an independent party, proud of our achievements and determined to rebuild our strength. I will reserve the rest of what I have to say until we see the shape of the new government, uh, whatever that might be later today. For now, I wish to commend the name of Deputy John Bruton to the House. He has earned the respect of everyone in this House, and I know that he will honour the trust to repose in him to the full, as he has always done in the past. <laughs> The Minister for Social Welfare, Deputy Francis de Rossa. Um, uh, Concordia, or do you post on post no August and you is an or war a detain August on the clan August on party. I wish to see support the nomination of Deputy John Bruton as Taoiseach and thereby the uh, uh, Rainbow um, co Coalition work which we have done over the last two and a half years. When I stood in this house on December the 15th, 1994, to support on that occasion his nomination as Taoiseach, I referred to our different backgrounds, but said that I had come to admire and respect him during our period in opposition, and that I particularly respected the position he had taken on Northern Ireland. After two and a half years in government with him, my respect for John Bruton has increased, and indeed his public st stature has grown. I believe that he is the person who should be Taoiseach, uh, that he has the qualities of political courage and vision necessary to lead this country into the next century. John Bruton has been an outstanding Taoiseach and in office has confounded his strongest critics. A serious political thinker, he has shown himself to be open and to be interested in new ideas. He has never been afraid to change his mind when the facts change and this is an absolutely essential requirement for a gen genuine statesman. John Bruton has successfully presided over the first multi-party government since the 1950s. He always led by example, showing great energy and enthusiasm for the job, and displaying particular skills around the cabinet table. His capacity for work was enormous. He had an ability to be across virtually every item that came before government, but was always willing to delegate and to trust ministers to get on with their own work. The Irish people owe the Taoiseach, Deputy John Bruton, a debt of gratitude for the political leadership he has shown, often in very difficult circumstances over the past 30 months. 
In the event that uh, John Bruton is not elected and that it's uh, the uh, Fianna Fáil PD uh, co coalition uh, that is, is a leg, leg elected, uh, it would seem to me that uh, we are facing into a different type of go 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 government and a different uh, set of policies. The decision to enter government was a... a, a <coughs> Well, well, I, uh, the decision, the decision to enter, the people have cast their vote in the general election, and as de Democrats, of course, we accept the outcome without question. But we leave government with our heads high, satisfied that we had served the people of this country well, if not perfectly. Pleased with the, what the rainbow has achieved, while acknowledging that with more time, much more could have been achieved, particularly for the disadvantaged and the marginalised who are not sharing in the current prosperity. And I'm proud too of the performance of democratic left minimum ministers and backbenchers. Not without, withstanding the outcome of the election, the fact is that, what, that the outgoing government one of, one, of, one of the best administrations this country has had. The country is being passed temporarily, let me say, to the care of Fianna Fáil and the PDs in a far better condition than it was when that party last left office. More than 120,000 new jobs were created. The numbers on the live register were reduced to their lowest level for six years. Real progress was made in regard to reform and integration of the tax and social welfare systems. The structural and mechanisms for the implementation of a national anti-poverty strategy were put in place. Housing was revitalised, mortgage rates kept low, inflation kept low, and the most comprehensive anti-crime package ever was introduced. Local communities were given real resources to fight the drugs menace, and the responsible and effective leadership was provided in continuing search for peace and political solution to the problems of Northern Ireland. I would like to give notice to the incoming administration. The democratic left will bring to the opposition the same innovative thinking, commitment and energy and enthusiasm that it showed in government. Yeah, yeah. You can expect vigorous, principled and responsible opposition from democratic left. And based on the programme for government published by Fianna Fáil and the PDs, vigorous opposition is what the incoming government will deserve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. While there are some positive commitments in the programme, especially where it pledges to build on the work done by the outgoing government, there are also many vague, unspecific and in some cases dangerous proposals. In general, Fianna Fáil appears to have dictated most of the policy positions. But in the area of taxation, <coughs> Bertie Ahern, Deputy Bertie Ahern seems to have surrendered totally to Deputy Harney or perhaps it was surrender to <coughs> Deputy McCreevy, we don't know yet. Slashing the upper tax rate while maintaining the tax allowances at the existing levels in real terms will do nothing to ease the burden on the vast majority of the people of this con con country. Furthermore, furthermore, this approach will bring at least 20,000 low-paid workers into the tax net for the first time. This formula was tried by Fianna Fáil and the PDs in the last time in government, and the result was that the average tax paid by the PAYE worker increased by 17% during the three years that it was in office. The tax policies of the new government may indeed represent payback time for those who control the Irish independent or dictate its editorial policy, but for most workers, but for most workers, it will be a case of pay as you wear. I'm glad, I'm glad that the Fianna Fáil and the PDs have apparently abandoned their threat to scrap the Electoral Act, which provides for open disclosure of political donations. But the PDs, I believe, have made a serious error in agreeing to Fianna Fáil demands for a review of the electoral system. Fianna Fáil have made no secret of its desire to see an end to our existing system of proportional representation, and it now seems that Deputy Harney has given them the opening they were seeking. Our electoral system is one of the fairest and most representative in the world. Without it, smaller parties would find it very difficult to secure representation in the Dáil. By agreeing to this review, Deputy Harney seems to be acknowledging the doubts about the future of the PDs and implicitly accepting that their future may lie in a return to the Fianna Fáil family. I want to put down a clear marker and state that Democratic Left will vigorously oppose any attempt to make our electoral system less fair, 
less proportional or less representative. We will oppose any and all attempts to do away with a single transferable vote and multi-seat constituencies. Yeah, yeah. There are many items I could refer to. There are many items I could refer to here at the moment, but for but can I make one a particular could I make one particular appeal, if I might, to an incoming government? And that is that they would build on the progress made by the outgoing Rainbow Coalition in relation to providing services for children and adults with a mental handicap. It is a very serious problem and one that must be dealt with urgently. Finally, it is quite extraordinary that the PD Fianna Fáil programme for government does not contain a commitment to the implementation of the National Anti-Poverty Strategy, which was painfully constructed in partnership with the voluntary sector and to which there is a commitment in Partnership 2000 by all the social partners. That failure to commit itself to reaching the targets set in that National Anti-Poverty Strategy with regard to reducing poverty and disadvantage taken in tandem with his proposal to penalise low-paid workers through the tax pa package it proposes, I think brings into grave doubt the capacity of the Fianna Fáil and P PD co coalition to retain the support of any independents in this House for very long. Thank you. Uh, Deputy David Andrews. Yes, sir. First of all, Clan Corda, may I offer uh, as one of the <coughs> longer-serving members like yourself in this House my congratulations. Uh, I believe you're... Uh, long service, integrity and basic decency uh, entitles it to your job and I've no doubt that the House will cooperate 100% with you. So I congratulate you from the, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Count Corla, the people of Ireland had voted for change. Uh, we now must uh, chose one of our number to form the government which will lead uh, the people of this country into the next millennium. Uh, and they do expect this government to be led from the front. Uh, they expect the leader of this government to be fair, honest and decisive. They expect him to chose his government on the basis of ability uh, and with a clear vision of what will be required uh, of our government uh, for the next number of years. Most of all, they look to him to open a new page in the development of our country uh, and our island. The leader have the, the, the leader of the people have chosen is uh, Mr. Bertie Ahern, TD. He's a member of this house, well, by majority, I would have thought. <laughs> However, the, the, the leader of this house, just to repeat, uh, I can't call it, the leader of this house have chosen uh, Bertie Ahern, uh, He's a member of this house for uh, a long time uh, and I, I, I know him to have the iron in his soul to, to be a great leader and to make this country of ours proud. Uh, it's my great privilege and pleasure and honour uh, to seek the endorsement of this house uh, for the nomination of Mr Bertie Ahern, TD, to be the next Taoiseach. Thank you. I want to second formally and have great honour and happiness in doing so to second the name of Bertie Ahern as Taoiseach of this country and to put it to the members of the Dáil here today. Fifteen years ago, Bertie Ahern was Minister of State at the Department of Antisha. And 15 years on, he is set, we believe, to be the Taoiseach of this country. There is no doubt that in the challenging years which lie ahead, both nationally and internationally, a person with the calibre and character of Bertie Ahern is someone that this country can justly and will be proud of. He has both vision and stamina, but most of all he has understanding. And it is that understanding which led the people of this country to put their trust in him. And it is now that trust which I know he will repay back to the country in full measure. I have very real pleasure in seconding my colleague, da colleague David Andrews. And I know full well that in Bertie Ahern, the people of this country will have a Taoiseach of whom they will be proud. Uh, 
Deputy Mary Harney. Uh, Kian Corla, can I begin by congratulating you on being elected as Kian Corla of this House and by being elected unanimously? Um, I've been reading over the last few days that you're the father of the House. I think for the future we'll have to find a more gender-neutral way of describing our longest-serving member. But although I pride myself in being young, I discovered this morning that I'm the longest-serving female in this House now that Deputy Maura Gagan Quinn has retired. But I certainly don't want to be described as the mother of the House, I can assure you. <laughs> can, I, can, I thank, can I thank the Thornish and the Labour Party for putting forward Deputy Seamus Patterson because I think in doing that you have played your part in trying to help the establishment of stable government and I think that should be acknowledged here this afternoon. Today is a very special day particularly for the new members of this house and I'd like to welcome them and their families. Many of them have seen their political ambitions realised. Uh, perhaps their dreams fulfilled and they're coming into this house at a very exciting time to the 28th doll because this doll will take our country into the next century and the honour to serve is indeed a great honour um, and it's one that we should never take lightly but there's a huge responsibility too uh, on all our parts to ensure that whether we're in government or opposition we do what's required to sustain our democracy. I set out in the election campaign, I remember saying here on the 15th of May that politics would be on trial. By the time the election was over, I think I was on trial. And uh, I intend to prove over the next few years that nurses and teachers and Gardaí have nothing to fear. I want to see a dynamic public service serving our country. I want to be, I want to be, can I, can I just say to members of the government, this is not a day to have a go and I don't think we should engage in that. There's many, lots of things. And, and, I, and I might in passing pay tribute to the government. They all worked extremely hard, particularly the Taoiseach, the Taunister and the Minister for Social Welfare. And I must say I admired, I admired the fact that right up to the end, the Taoiseach and the Taunish sought to have the peace restored in Northern Ireland and I'd like to congratulate him and the British government for the initiatives uh, that have been agreed between our two countries. I think at last uh, it forces the Republican movement to make a stark choice between peace and democratic politics on the one hand or violence on the other. And I hope that we never again have to look at the scenes we saw on our television screens last week to see the young Johnson and Graham children wonder what they deserved to have to face that kind of tragedy. I hope that's the end of that and that we never see it again. And I want to be part... I want to be part of a government that restores that peace and delivers a real and lasting political settlement to Northern Ireland, that creates in Northern Ireland a partnership society where nationalists and unionists can equally feel at home, where that society respects the equal legitimacy of both traditions. And I look forward to being part of a government that brings that about. And certainly I'll spare no effort to ensure that we achieve that. Equally, I want to be part, equally, I want to be part of a government that sustains the economic boom through prudent management of our economy, that gives workers a break. And I'm talking about ordinary workers, single people earning 11 or 12,000 pounds a year should not be paying 55% tax. They are the people that have created the boom and the time has come to ensure that they get the rewards from the boom that they've created. Equally, I want to be part of a government that tackles the crime crisis. And today, it's worth remembering that it's exactly a year since the tragic murder of Veronica Gearn, a woman apart who pursued the truth. And the, the greatest thing we could do in memory of her name is to ensure that we rid our society of the kind of crime that caused her tragic and premature death. I want to be part of a government too that tackles our two-tier society. The fact is that so many in our country are marginalised, no opportunity to work, no hope, a very poor standard of education. They have no right to participate in the economic development of our country. And the challenge for the next governments is to ensure that we have less marginalisation, that there's more hope, that people have dignity and self-respect. And that's why that's such a central feature of the programme for government. And lastly, can I say, any sense of personal excitement I feel today, uh, obviously, uh, has to be uh, somewhat lessened by the fact that three of my colleagues, outgoing colleagues, Helen Kyo, uh, Maureen Quill and Michael McDool, have not been re-elected to this House. Uh, I regret that very much. They were all outstanding deputies, great parliamentarians who worked extremely hard. And can I say to the Minister for Social Welfare, 
I would not change the electoral system uh, that would in any way handicap smaller parties, but smaller parties did very badly in this election, uh, notwithstanding our existing electoral system, and that is a fact. I want, in particular, uh, to thank uh, those deputies in my party who weren't re-elected and to say that their absence takes away from any sense of excitement, as I said, that I might feel about other matters. But there are very good deputies from every party that lost their seat. Very good deputies indeed, some of whom worked very hard as ministers and ministers of state. And we shouldn't forget them on a day like today. Many of them are probably watching this, these proceedings and feeling somewhat sad that they're not part of these events. The Progressive Democrats entered in uh, to negotiations with the Fianna Fáil party and we concluded a programme for government. I have to say uh, the spirit in which those negotiations were carried out was very refreshing and I welcome that very much. I think it augurs well for the new government. And in particular, I'd like to pay tribute uh, to Bertie Ahern, somebody I've known for 20 years, somebody I trust and respect. I think he, uh, negotiated, he negotiated in a very honourable and fair fashion. And I want to be part of a government where people, where people respect each other, where there's mutual trust. Uh, the programme for government is clearly significant. But sometimes what's equally important is that parties understand each other's needs. And in coalition governments, things can be achieved by putting guns to people's heads. But where things are achieved in that way, they're pyrrhic victories because they damage relationships and they undermine the kind of confidence and trust that is essential uh, if a government is to be stable, if it's to be policy driven, if it's to be focused on the issues. And we are only interested in participating in a government that is policy driven, that is stable from the outset and that is focused on the needs of our people because that's what we must be determined to do. So the Progressive Democrats will be supporting uh, the nomination the nomination of Bertie Ahern. Order. The Deputy Harney, now, without interruption, please. Can I say, I'm interested in looking to the future and not looking to the past, and I wish members of the government would at least hear me out. Uh, in supporting uh, the nomination of Bertie Ahern, uh, the Progressive Democrats uh, are looking forward to participating uh, in a coalition government uh, with Fianna Fáil and playing our part to ensure that that government that that government leaves no stone unturned in addressing and confronting the issues that face our society. And all of us must have an open mind about confronting issues and being open to new ideas, no matter what they are or where they come from. And lastly, can I again pay tribute uh, to the outgoing Taoiseach John Bruton. I know he made enormous efforts uh, to stay in power. And I suppose one would have to say, uh, one would have to say, uh, nobody, nobody likely gives up power, but I know the Taoiseach made enormous efforts uh, to, 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 to hold on to office. But the fact is uh, that we are going to have in place uh, after today a new government. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with the Taoiseach uh, as leader of Fine Gael in opposition, with the Taunish as leader of the Labour Party, with Minister de Rossa. Politics is about ideas. It's those ideas that sustain us when we have setbacks. And that is... And De will Deputy Sheehan please and that is, remain? And that is what must come first and not personalities. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. before, before I give the floor to Deputy... Before I give the floor to Deputy Gregory, could I just remind members that we're discussing the motion on the nomination of the person to be Taoiseach and that um, we shouldn't anticipate a discussion on a motion that will be uh, taken later on the, today in relation to the ministers and there may be a, a tendency to, to drift into that area. So let us hear more about the merits of the candidates that have been proposed here. Uh, Deputy Gregory, please. Thank you, Karen Corley. I'll try to be as relevant to the motion as the previous speakers were, Chair, Karen <laughs> Corley. Um, but, but while I'm a dusk, my co-gardicus parson to Cornul Ditcha, Karen Corley, as I'm bust re havoctuk of winter mock, Tommy Kinta Golani Tula, Tradishun, and Nav Splakish, Satakshaw, Mar Win and Nav Splakish, a special to Lesh and Bushin. I was good dirty to Maradur to Fane, good dirty to Kurfram the Fane doing her fad on show, the Gok Chakta. Talan is a gum, Gershin a Tai Geshtagot. Before stating the manner in which I intend to vote on the nomination of Tisha Kyan Korya, may I take the opportunity 
to thank all those who voted for me in this, my seventh successive general election. And uh, indeed all those who campaigned for me in those elections. It is of course of concern to me that the constituency of Dublin Central, where I was one of those elected, had one of the lowest turnouts in the state. Out of an electorate of almost 64,000, a little over 36,000 turned out to vote. In Dublin Central, nearly 28,000 people did not believe it worthwhile to vote at all. This may not be surprising given that Dublin Central has within it some of the most disadvantaged communities socially and economically of anywhere in this country. A very recent study found that Dub the Dublin 1 and the Dublin 10 postal districts, both of which are in Dublin Central, are the two areas with the lowest access to third level education in Ireland. In the region of 4% of children compared to 54% in affluent Dublin 4 go on to college or university. Unemployment statistics show parts of Dublin 10 has been the worst unemployment black spot with in excess of 50% unemployment. Other smaller, more, more localised inner city neighbourhoods have even higher and endemic unemployment levels. These are the areas where the heroin drug problem was ignored, allowed to fester, and spread out of control for 15 years, destroying hun hundreds of young lives and demoralizing once proud communities. The crime problem associated with heroin undermined normal life and drug dealers took effective control of whole neighbourhoods. Decent people lived in constant fear in their own homes in the centre of our capital city. Heroin was even sold openly on O'Connell Street. This was and is the reality of social exclusion in Ireland. Few voices were raised to give leadership to the people or to draw attention to these issues. One who did, Veronica Guerin, was murdered a year ago today. Not one of the principals involved in that crime, have, those who ordered and carried out the crime, have so far been charged with her murder. The total loss of confidence of people in the institutions of the state was recently dramatically seen in the anti-drug marches, when people organised to regain control of their own communities from drug dealers. The anti-drugs marches transformed parts of Dublin, which had become virtual dru drug-infested no-go areas. Local people in Cabra, Ballyfermot and the inner city stood up to be counted to turn the tide against the drug bosses. Some of these people, to whom we are all indebted, are now being brought before the courts on the evidence of persons who are the scourge of decent people, evidence which should have no credibility. The judiciary pr presiding over these cases are totally out of touch with the issues on which they are passing judgment. This is an injustice heaped on injustice, and if it continues, will only aggravate social tensions. An amnesty must be seriously considered for anti-drugs campaigners. Social exclusion and the heroin crime problem are the legacy of neglect of the main political parties in successive governments. That is the appalling record of those who have failed the people of Dublin Central, which is of course only a microcosm of the increasingly divided society whose architects were and are in the main political parties. All of what I have referred to is set against a background of a booming economy, presenting the incoming Taoiseach and government with the greatest single opportunity 
to concentrate resources in the areas of most need and make a real and genuine attempt to end social exclusion and create a more equal society. However, the record of the Progressive Democrats and Fianna Fáil in government does not inspire any confidence that this will happen. The last occasion the Progressive Democrat Fianna Fáil coalition was in government. Homeless people died of the cold on the streets of Dublin. That is the record. If a Fianna Fáil PD government is elected on this occasion, I trust and I hope that it will not mean a continuation of a divided society or that the great opportunity presented by the economic boom will be squandered. Only time will tell if that is to be the case. But many vulnerable people throughout this country are fearful of the influence of the PDs over the incoming government. Count Corley, I want to conclude by welcoming on this occasion the election of so many independent deputies and members of small parties and express the hope that they can work together in the incoming dial as an effective counterbalance against the progressive, de the progressive Democrats. I will be voting today against both leaders of both Conservative parties. Good morning, Count Corley. Deputy Trevor Sargent. Aaron Corla, near enough she gets to come later to complain to show I guess take him the cost nor there into her car doing a vet a kind needs for the need and vote. Ah, has to go him nor the Danielle Glart a raw a do spoil a cogardous latza as on post it up into Macagut is is larger post on a yakare August Guil on a vish Macagut toward free. Mar is kinta nach me gach eina sasta tuart fui um, ach kinta tal she tiltigot agus squim gach rahert. Uh, er an daradol shias boalim falchas fi a cur rivma kolaki ansha John Gormley a ta tuffa dun keidur agus uh, a curran a curran in arch fille me hain kuma dvor nach din a nyavs a sail on on an a sail on tea show a hill of may ach gur gur dinner the forty may anish on quaintest glass in some chuck august home bert going on nilay nilay doubt a gum ach will on vert a tall round on show mar over he shig on a wa marguini august ganyan is she'd pay last her son the tira Don't make chance to go as father. Ach, mother lesson go into slas. Ni faderling ach a raw. Garbiog on differiacht. A ta ither an kinal realtish. A vianown. Ma ta dinna wine aganus no dinna ella. Is kinta will differiacht ti. Agus ta parson tak ti. Agus is kinta will ruddy lider agus ruddy laga a wintlio galer. Maratoging a leg. Ach fos hain, er na corli kunde timpel na tira, ta an na parte a lig a ta an sha e koai bru le kele. Agus kahi misha a ra mar mar veld an koai tis glas. Gumin she marangena, de vor go willamid e glanun teraig le policy he ach na miakta ach go hire he a ta marangena in sin da chas. Ma vienya egeistacht agus credin grev gilior, leshen dishach in nuar aurach, is kinta grev ana chaktrukt eg nadinia via kind kuglina tres rio, tres and rudder hokter the earth summit. Agus vi nadinia via kind on shin, eg rog a gahamid galer koai brule kela, a gahamid ave a dain of ruddy gahana yef ruler fad a makan sha, fui marata dain to fui Ach insen klar realtish a ta falche eg finna fall agus na pidina ni elain rod suntasak a veg mar yifriakt either on realtis nua a veg le chakt agus on realtis ella ta imha agus marshin is more on trua 
don't go into slas or oligaha. August is through a bay or coma, not grev a cached curta earning river, con tourami a nocta madalesh and clar real to nua, a false shin maraha. Eterundal ling, Tom Widner, mar forty in some frasura, August begmid sasta coai bru, leshna parte ella, August nadini navs blaka ella, a veg of frasura. Beg sheedson, a den of anichel coma linge. Agus Quigashin, Ta Misha Era, Gomegon Cointus Las Extena, Er Anam John Bruton, Inson Inson uh, <coughs> Inson Kinna Atala Janov, Ak Gomegmi de Vota and Igan Realtish, Marta Shans Kailta Aku, Tortvi Klar, Eveg and Irunt, Dan Ish Shakoing, Agus Eveg Egtastol, Agus de Yi Erling, Agus Quigashin, Tommy de Gsul, Gurla Makansha, Gurfeder Las. Natira of Wintermach, three Ahru Suntasak, in Snapolisa Aknamik, a Vega Lanunt. Good of Milamago de Kian Corn. Deputy Mildred Fox. Kian Corla. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate you yourself on your elevation to the position of Kian Corla. I think as fathers of the house, it is very fitting that you would hold this position of honour and responsibility, and I would like to wish you a very happy and successful term as Ken Corla. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to wish Sean Tracy a very happy and peaceful retirement. I am conscious of the privilege that has been bestowed upon me by the people of Wicklow and East Carlow to be their voice in Dáil Éireann. And I'm equally conscious of the responsibility of public office at both local and national levels. The decision taken in, these, in this house affects the lives and livelihoods of every person in this state. And in deciding how to cast my vote for Taoiseach, I have considered a number of issues. I have studied the new Fianna Fáil PD programme for government in detail, and I sincerely hope that the government can deliver on a lot of proposals outlined in that programme. And in particular, I welcome some of their proposals on crime. I think on the day that's in it, with Veronica Guerin's uh, anniversary today, I think it's at the back of everybody's minds here today. And I sincerely hope again that they can deliver on some of the proposals. The vote for Taoiseach will be one of the most important decisions taken by this House. It will decide what government leads this country into the next millennium. And a Taoiseach for whom I vote must be somebody that I can trust can deliver on his promises, not just to me and my constituency, but to the electorate in general. They must be aware of the needs for young people and must bring forward policies that will make it easier for young people to further their education and retain more of their pay when they take up employment. For far too long in this country, our largest export has been young people, and we must encourage employment for young people in the field which they are trained. I am very conscious of the fact, and everybody's very conscious of the fact, that I've been elected as an independent TD, and I would like to state that I'm <coughs> remaining as an independent TD. I'm under no, no illusions that um, I, will, I now risk being aligned to a political party. But to do this, I needed an assurance that certain issues and projects would be delivered in my constituency during this government. As an independent, I have, I have endured the type of criticism that goes with the territory, and I'd like to clarify that I am just as interested as any other person in this house and any other person in this, co in this country that uh, I want a stable government as much as the next person. I have no intention of being the cause of the fall of any other government, but just like any other deputy, I will be facing the electorate, electorate I'm sorry, in five years, and I have issues that which will have to be addressed. I have an agreement that a certain number of these issues will be treated as a matter of priority. One such priority is a secondary school to cope with the rapidly growing population in the North East Wicklow area. A site is already available in Kilcool and I have an undertaking that the planning process will start immediately with building to start no later than 1998. County Wicklow is one of the only two counties without a district veterinary office and I have been assured that a district veterinary office will be provided in the East Wicklow area. Wicklow as a county suffers from a disadvantage in that the western part of the county is cut off from the eastern part by a broad mountain range. And that makes it very difficult for people in the west part of the county to do business with Wicklow County Council, which is located in the east. People from the western part of the county who wish to submit planning applications or tax their cars should be able to do so with the minimum of inconvenience. I have been given an undertaking that a sub-office of Wicklow County Council will be opened in Blessington as a matter of urgency. I'd 
just like to <laughs> assure the yeah. House that I did afford Will you please, both sides. please allow the deputy in possession to continue, please. <laughs> deputy Mildred Fox, without interruption. Deputy Mildred Fox, without interruption, please. Lachlanstown Hospital, although it's not in my own constituency, is the main hospital to serve Wicklow and it has been collecting funds for some time to purchase a CAT scan. The shortfall in funds will be provided within a matter of months. I have been giving, I have been given an undertaking on many other matters which will benefit every community, some of which are not costly and are not matters of great importance nationally, but they are very, very important to Wicklow and East Carlow. Politics is about listening to people on the ground and giving them their policies that they want. And the person for whom I will vote as Taoiseach must listen to people. He must understand their needs and must, import, must more importantly respond to their needs. I am voting for Bertie Hearn today as Taoiseach and I would like to wish him and the incoming government very well. Thank you. I I now call on Deputy Joe Higgins. Deputy Joe Higgins has the floor. Account Corla. Deputy Count Joe Corla. Higgins, please. Account Corla, having been honoured by the support of substantial numbers of the ordinary people of Dublin West to stand in the 28th Hall, it is my intention in this debate and in future debates to bring to the fore their real issues affecting them, their concerns, their problems, and their aspirations for change and for a better society. This is the debate on the election of Taoiseach. I, as a deputy of the Socialist Party, am faced by a nominee each from Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, two parties which have dominated polit political life in this state since its foundation and which must carry, therefore, and its nominees, a major share of the responsibility for the shape of the society that we have at the present time. And from the shape of that society, we can also gauge the shape of the future society that their nominations will mean. This, however, is not a judgment at all on personalities, but is a political judgment on political parties and on political records. And politically, both of those parties which have nominees stand condemned for their abject failure over decades and in recent times to create the conditions in our society where the, the marvelous resources of this society and the marvelous talents of our people could have been harnessed to guarantee a life free from want for all from unemployment and from many of the problems that we face at the present time. Both candidates worship the new god of the market, which is not a democratic organization of society, but an economic dictatorship by which a tiny minority wield massive power affecting the lives of millions, as tragically 600 workers in United Technologies in Derry have just discovered, as did workers in Packard Electric separate and other areas. The parties which have nominated uh, le potential leaders today are those responsible for a million of our people being forced into involuntary exile on foreign shores and responsible still for tens of thousands of our youth being also in exile. The economic establishment backed by these parties, they are responsible for the criminal neglect of many working class communities which have allowed long term unemployment to blight those societies, which have allowed abysmal lack of facilities to create a life that is an enormous struggle for so many of our people. This neglect over decades is directly responsible for the heroin crisis that bedevils many of our communities at the present time and the crime that follows it. I blame the establishment for the suffering of the drug addict, for their heartbroken families and parents, for the problems in the community that must suffer. 
And were it not for the fact that ordinary people themselves have risen up against the brutal pusher and against neglect, the political establishment and today's nominees would still be in the dark. I blame them for the plight of thousands of our people on the waiting list for local authority homes at the present time. We are on the verge of a major housing crisis in this society, exacerbated by the insane increase in house prices over the last two years, again a consequence of a market gone mad. How can this problem be acknowledged, particularly by Deputy Ahern and his side, when the aspiring Thornishta on whose votes he dearly relies must believe that working class families live in mansions and that unexpected additions to the family can be catered for presumably by opening up some unused extension or other. The proposals of the nominees to cut a few percentage points of the tax rate at the lower level by itself does not constitute taxation justice for the PAYE worker, the workhorse, the workhorse of the tax system for so long. Taxation justice would involve the levying of taxes on the massively profitable banks, financial institutions and powerful corpor corporations at a level approximating that of the PAYE worker. What hope of tax justice can we, when the five parties which are vying for power today have stood aside and still stand aside, while thousands of decent householders, the backbone of the PAYE system, are even now being dragged through the courts by the local authorities for arrears of a discredited double tax on water, now abolished as a result of a magnificent demonstration of their people power. And when incredibly next Wednesday, Fingal County Council moves in the circuit court to confirm orders for water disconnection, no less, against some of those householders. By contrast, one of the nominees, Deputy Hearn, backed shamefully by the Labour Party, presided over the writing off of 500 million pounds in a tax amnesty for the most privileged and powerful sections of society, not one of whom darkened the doorway of a courthouse in sharp contrast of how ordinary people are being treated for opposing an unjust tax. What hope of tax justice from these nominees when one of our highest profile semi-state companies, Team Aer Lingus, regularly employs with their obvious knowledge thousands of workers from abroad on a casual basis paying their wages without tax into offshore bank accounts to undermine working conditions and confidence of the Irish workforce in that company who have built up that company with their sacrifice and who pay taxes to the maximum effect. No ordinary person, uh, what, what hope, Count Corla, of taxation justice from these nominees when their parties, joined by the, the three other parties that back them, have their hands permanently outstretched for funds to the wealthiest and most powerful sections of Irish society, for donations to oil their political machines to keep their political careers going. In relation, Cahir, look to the tragic situation in Northern Ireland. Does anybody think that political, a political establishment down here that treats their citizens in this way can inspire confidence in ordinary people in the North, a section of whom are already deeply suspicious of this state? or help overcome the sectarian chasm that exists in the north. Of course, an immediate ceasefire is 30 years overdue. And the, the tragedy of paramilitary violence and violence from the British state has to be brought to an end immediately. But the peace process must be built not by deals between politicians at the top, but by fostering the unity of working class communities to tackle the major problems which they equally face. I hope to be a voice for many inadequately cared for, catered for people in our society. People with disabilities, the, the friends and families of mentally handicapped who have no respite at the present time, those who need heart and lung transplants in our own country, those seeking refuge who in the course of the general election campaign were disgracefully scapegoated by some politicians in a cynical bid to achieve votes. Cahir Luck, some pundits would say that a deputy from a small party or an independent deputy has to support one or other nominees from the major parties to make any difference. 
I do not subscribe to that. These pundits have advised the parties of the left traditionally to sink into coalitionism with the parties of the right. That has been the traditional route of the Labour Party, with disastrous consequences for the left and a total failure to build the left as a credible force in our society. Leading supporters up the hill of hopeless compromise and after a few years being booted down by a disappointed electorate. That unfortunately has been the role of Labour and Democratic left when in fact they could have taken a role of providing a real alternative for our people to take on and build an alternative to the establishment. I stand here look for the building of a strong and an independent left whose only agenda is the creation of a powerful movement of ordinary people independent of the clutches of the conservative establishment to fight on all the issues and to lobby for democratic socialist change in our society where the material resources and the talents of our society will be utilized for the benefit of all our people rather than for the obscene greed of a very few. Kahir, look, it's my privilege as I come to the end of my remarks to take a quote from James Connolly, one of the great founders of the labor movement and of socialism in our society, in which he outlined that the resources of our society have to be developed for all the people and said, a system of society in which the whole human race will be secured against the fear of want for all time, a system in which all men and women will be joint heirs and owners, and of all the intellectual and material con conquests made possible by associated uh, effort. Cahir, look, therefore, my vote today will be to ensure the independence of the left. I will give no credibility to any of the establishment parties and will vote against them. Davrishin Hyan Korle, Tasha Seleir, Nakhvil Minin or Behagomse, a character than Mert Takta, a ta animinha in Santalkan Shah, the first and Tishig in Uv. Neil Minin, a gum unte, now in a bar to her politiata. Is he at the Parson Shah, Agus Naparte her, a minin shield law, Agus Nareel Tishi, in the Revshield Partuk, River Shah, a ta fragruk as Nav Raytuk, the Fibon the Gera, a ta Kurishtak, a could more demean to the Tida in some law in Uv. Kukamik Horomik to Gursi Karnuk, or Yarkalok PAYE, on Diastik for Termuk, on Gerkem, a winning Leshon drug heroin, a mass cosfin to the Artlig Morvor. Isid Atar Fragrok, as Navratic Navib, Agas Kinta Nakwil Ain Policy Nuoka, a Yurok and the Fibuna, Agas Akhidak Lias Erfall. Dinat Samuyihal, Insna Blenta Atar Ruin Mark. Nagadine a hort in Shahistak, Agas Kok, then Lahak Nagadine a Kurivaim, Erangoras Politirte, Kun Malat Politirte, Kun Riru, then Lahak, Agas Sosilak a Kurt Kunkin, Erak the Mirk, Agas Selg in Lotan the Tide, Rodahurig a Kahirlik, Desh, then Kiadoid, the Gach Nail, Sel Usaduk, Agas Lebri Usaduk of Intimak, Agas Inserfed in the Kunilaka a Kahu. Achidhig, Dere Leshen Diastiot, Leshen Bokhtanas, Leshen Kuriulot, Agasan Follent, the Moorhood, Darvinter. Remil Mahabad. Again, again, let me remind, let me remind uh, deputies that the motion before the House is the nomination of a Taoiseach. Deputy Healy Ray. Count <coughs> Corla. Fellow members, this is the proudest day of my life to stand elected here by the people of South Kerry. For the past several weeks, I traversed the highways and byways of that constituency in South Kerry. The people supported me and voted for me, and I'm up here on a mission to work for all the people that selected me and elected me and all the people of South Kerry. During my campaign around that constituency, there were many other matters which I want to see dealt with during the five years of the incoming government. Some which I'll have to refer and mention here in this house. <laughs> Jobs. Since the closure of the pretty poly factory in Killarney, very few, 
very, very few, very Order. few industrial jobs have been created in South Kerry. Many people are now travelling huge distances to find work. We require a significant new industry for Killarney as well as a number of industries right around the South Kerry constituency, tourism. We also want to extend the tourist season in South Kerry. <laughs> we cannot, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot expect Order, please. young people. Please. Order. Deputy Healy Ray, without interruption, please. We cannot, no we cannot expect young people to work in an industry which is only seasonal. This is also causing major problems for employers, for employers looking for staff. Number one, the government urgently needs to invest more money in tourism so that rural areas like South Kerry can have a year-round tourist season. Farmers and small farmers. I have called for immediate assistance for our farmers and in particular our hill farmers whose income has fallen dramatically over the past 12 months alone. I want the restoration of live cattle exports immediately. Number two, I want the reintroduction of fair of development grants to enable our farmers to avail of the most modern farming methods. Fishermen. I want, I want realistic grants for small fishermen to improve or replace their craft. I want special funding and I have asked for special funding to repair and upgrade the neglected piers that are in a disgraceful condition in the constituency of South Kerry. And I'm going to mention one here in this house today. That's in command down near Killarland. When the fishermen... Order, order, when please. the fishermen in command will go out and come back with their boat, there is no pier to put in beside. What, what is there by these men to make a livelihood is a fairly derelict four-wheel drive tractor. <laughs> to drive out to meet that boat and bring in the catch. This cannot and will not prevail in command in the future. For our young people in South Kerry, I want stable and viable employment and not dead in schemes. I want access to educational courses that are relevant to modern industry. In particular, I want to reduce the cost of car insurance for the under 25s and this must be done. I want an increase the awareness among young people and their parents of the sad and tragic consequences of drug abuse right around our country. Local and regional roads and all roads in Kerry. The local road crisis affects us all. There are regional roads in South Kerry and I might as well add South West Cork. <laughs> Will Deputy Sheehan please These stop roads are in a disgraceful condition. Lack of finance for the roads in South Kerry 
are no acceptable excuse. This problem will have to be addressed immediately by the incoming government. I have called for a massive injection of money and investment in local roads in South Kerry. I, su I suggest to the incoming government that the entire amount of car tax revenue should be used for this purpose as it was intended to be. Safety of all people live alone. The safety of all people live alone is of great concern to me. Rural post offices and guard stations in rural areas that are closed will have to be reopened and kept open. And a stronger guard presence is needed in all isolated areas. The restoration of grants, the restoration of grants at realistic levels for the repair and restoration of old dwelling houses would encourage young couples to set up home with their elderly parents. The very serious problems in Northern Ireland affect us all. I offer my total commitment and support to the new government in providing a peaceful solution to the terrible situation in Northern Ireland. There are many other matters of great importance to me, which I hope and I'm promised will be addressed during the lifetime of this government, which include health cutbacks, housing, agriculture. I will maintain all my best efforts on behalf of my constituents. I have discussed Deputy Sheehan, please, will Deputy Sheehan please stop interrupting? I have all these matters discussed with uh, Betty Ahern. <laughs> he has listened. Order, please. Order. Order. He has listened Deputy. very attentively to me and discussed the problems that he knows exist. During the time of this government, during the term of this government, I hope that we'll have these problems in South Kerry addressed and corrected and put right. Now, I'm going around the corner today and I'm voting for Betty Ahernes Tishuk on the clear understanding that we will address the problems in South Kerry. I am elected by the people of, of South Kerry here as an independent deputy. I have no intention whatsoever of changing that status. I'll still be an independent all the way through. I want to thank each and every single person in South Kerry that elected me and sent me up here in a mission. And I want to thank... And I want to... I want to carry out... I want to carry out my instructions to the letter of the law. And I can assure everybody in South Kerry that I will be representing them here in this house over the next number of years. Don't write me off, I'm warning you. Deputy O'Kalon. Good morning, because <laughs> Don Kogal Shah. His party public tuck a Sinn Fein, agus a vocal or roger in the public ta ni gaid as a shejig. Jarvermid gur cart canasak do tlicha, cart winch in the heron, con tear in the heron, agus fos con dal in the heron, a stureu con cusk con turmishk. Neil on canasak umlon fos eg winch in the heron, agus is a bun cospor mafarti and public illa eranak a curr bun. Tagaman shah, 
Marana di o cantor ta imel yak le fada, le fada on law. Margal o creek yalt ar dira, agas margal o nyavard ar realtas in ye realtas sa stocha. Marjakta, beche marvona imagam, jera a cor lechon nyavard shin, agas machanter a cor rash ilar falatirt na tirisha. I am honored to stand here today, a Count Kolya and fellow deputies, as a deputy for the people of Cavan and Monaghan, and as a representative of Sinn Féin, the party of which I am proud to be a member. I represent an All-Ireland party that enjoys a significant mandate in both parts of our divided island, and I welcome the presence here today of my colleagues, Jerry Adams MP for West Belfast and Martin McGuinness MP for Mid Ulster. I look forward to the day when I will join them and all the others elected by the Irish people as a whole in a national parliament for the 32 counties. In the recent election, voters were offered a choice between two sets of coalition partners with virtually identical social and economic policies. From the composition of the House today, it is obvious that the electorate resented being forced to make such a choice. This reality is reflected in the growing strength of the smaller parties and independents. In the general election, Sinn Féin stood as a party for change. Our vision is of a new Ireland, a people united in shared prosperity. We note the failure of successive administrations in this state to fulfill the aim of the democratic programme of the first Doyle Erdem, which declared the right of every citizen to an adequate share of the produce of the nation's labour. This ongoing failure is evident in every town and village in Ireland and can be seen in the high level of long-term unemployment, rural decline and the growing drugs crisis. Promoting the interests of my constituents in Cavan and Monaghan and advancing the case for a fairer social and economic order based on equality, these will be my priorities during the course of the term before us. The partition of our country and Britain's occupation of the six northeastern counties is the single greatest problem facing us as a people today. The most important task for us all now is to rebuild the peace process. This must include the full recognition of Sinn Féin's electoral mandate by both governments. The way to lasting peace is through inclusive negotiations leading to political and constitutional change. The intense and positive engagement of the new government and of all the representatives in this House will be needed to bring that historic change about. On the vote for Taoiseach, therefore, Sinn Féin's priority is the rebuilding of the peace process. Accordingly, I will be casting my vote for Bertie Ahern as Taoiseach. I am doing so solely on the basis of his and his party's positive disposition towards a genuine and inclusive process. I look forward, I can call you, to working with the new government and with others in this House in the achievement of a lasting peace with justice for all the people of Ireland. Deputy Blaney. Deputy Blaney, without, I, I'd like to remind the House that it, it's by priests and deputies making their maiden speech are not interrupted. Yeah. Deputy Blaney. And Can Corlia, I would like to first of all I would like to first of all congratulate yourself on your election as Can Corlia and I'd hope to work with you for the duration of this term of uh, this house. I am also uh, very honoured to become an independent Fianna Fáil member of Dáil Éireann. I'd like to thank my organisation, Workers, Voters and Director of Elections, for making it possible for me to be a member of this house. And I was just reminded in coming into this house this evening that it's 70 years since my father was first 
electric to this, uh, to this dial. And uh, over that 70 years, that has continued, except for a very short hiccup in the recent past of over just a year from the last by-election in northeast Donegal. And I am honoured to be here today to carry on that tradition. It was first taken up by my father in 1927 and carried on by my late brother Neil up until someone over a year ago. Independents have an important role to play in the formation and working of this House and Government and they hope to play a positive and constructive role for the duration of this, the 28th Dáil. Our new government will have many problems to face over the term of this Dáil. As I see it, the most urgent problem facing our nation and the newly elected government will be to secure a genuine and lasting peace on this island, the foundation of which will have to be peace based on justice. That is justice for all the people of this nation. And I'd hope to play some part in helping the government towards this end. There will be many other problems, including unemployment, rural decline, crime, drugs and taxation. The loss of our young, educated people to immigration is a festering sore. We have the marginalisation and the depopulation of the West, and added to that are the neglected corridor on both sides of our border from Lough Fyle to Carlingford Lough. This neglect left my own county of Donegal marginalised more than any other. We have the highest rate of unemployment in this country at 33% and the lowest income per head of population of any county in Ireland. One of the main reasons for this is the neglect of our county by all governments and state agencies over the last number of years. We have not been getting our fair share of funds from central government or EU. I will be urging the incoming government to address this situation. I've been approached by the leaders of the two main political parties over the past few weeks for my support in the election of Tisha and the new government. I had discussions with both leaders relating to the serious situation that exists in the, no exists in the no six northeastern counties of this country. On the abortion issue, the position at the moment is unsatisfactory and cannot be allowed to continue. I will therefore be pressing the new government to put a properly worded referendum to the electorate so that a clear and unequivocal decision can be reached. I have also discussed with both leaders and made proposals to meet the urgent need in relation to my own county and have been assured by both leaders that this matter will get their serious attention and their response has been treated with respect and confidentiality. I would like to thank both leaders in the manner in which they have treated my proposals. <coughs> Following discussions with my organisation, our ta task was to evaluate who could best in the long term realistically deliver on my proposals. I had no doubt in the genuine interest of both leaders and their sincerity for the future of this state and the success of this the 28th Dáil. I have come to the conclusion that the elected want stable government and the best means of achieving this is through the election of a Fianna Fáil-led coalition government. I have therefore decided to cast my vote in favour of Mr Ahern if elected, and if elected, I would wish him well in the honourable task that lies ahead. I can assure him that I will treat with respect his honour position for the duration of this term of office. Thank you very much. Sorry, order please, order. Uh, yeah, I am putting the motions in the order in which they were proposed. I am now putting the question on the first motion. I am putting the question that Dáil Éireann nominates Deputy John Bruton for appointment by the President to be Taoiseach. Na tóchtí a tá ar héab na tarascint abridís tá. Na tóchtí a tá in a chine abridís níl. In my opinion, the question is negatized. Votal.
Deputy. Uh, I would like uh, to congratulate the incoming Taoiseach, uh, Deputy Bertie Ahern, on his choice by the Dáil to be Taoiseach. He brings to office a wealth of ministerial experience. He's somebody who has served with distinction in many offices. He also brings to high office uh, personality that will help him, I know, a great deal in working with colleagues and doing the business of government in an effective and fair and decent way. He also benefits from the support of a very large and experienced political party, Fianna Fáil, which uh, has served this country well over many years. And I wish him and his colleague, uh, Deputy Mary Harley, leader of the Progressive Democrats, well in the task that lies in front of them. Obviously, the, uh, this is common cause amongst all in this House, the economic conditions in which this new government will come into office in a few hours uh, are exceptional in historic terms. Never before have we seen such a rapid growth in employment. Never before have uh, mortgage and interest rates been at such a low level. And also, uh, the government comes into office at a time when the foundations have been laid for major moves forward towards the settlement in Northern Ireland. Uh, there is now a talks process in being open to all. And the principal difficulty in those talks, which would mean the issue of decommissioning, uh, has been one upon which in recent days the Irish and British governments have reached agreement on a way forward. That, I believe, creates very good conditions in which uh, the new government can give the necessary uh, impetus to the talks and enable matters to move forward. <coughs> Obviously, there are many challenges facing this country in the years ahead. There is the increasing uh, gap between those who are well off in our society and those who are not, those who are excluded by technology for participation in society or by lack of education. There is the growth in consumers and consumerist attitudes in our society which damages care for others, which is the essence of politics just as it is the essence of good personal living. And it is important that political decisions should represent and reflect what we would regard as good, honourable behaviour in our personal lives. And it's important, therefore, that we should have a caring government, a government that cares about everybody in our society. Obviously, the development of Europe Hopefully we will have a debate shortly on that topic uh, on foot of the Amsterdam summit. faces many challenges. We will, I believe, have on time a single European currency. But it's important that there be a similar political consensus in Europe if the necessary supporting decisions are to be taken to make that currency work. And it's important that the political will be created in Europe for that, and that may be lacking at the present time, and it's a challenge that will face the new government. <coughs> Social partnership has been a great success, and I'm glad, and one of the things I'm proud of is that the outgoing government has been successful in negotiating a new program, Program 2000. There will be increasingly virulent global forces affecting our economy and our people. We see this all the time. We are physically an island, but in no other sense are we an island. We're affected by what happens elsewhere. And the government must reconcile itself to the great increasing pressures in the world. It's important to know, to reflect on the fact that there are 450 million more people on this earth than there were on this earth at the time of the last general election in this jurisdiction. 450 million more people who need to be feed, fed, 450 more mil, million more people who create many uh, demands on our environment. It's important that we should think globally and act locally to ensure that we have a sustainable society for all our people. I also hope that the new government will put extreme emphasis on the development of education. Education is the key to Ireland's competitive economic success. I hope that the new government will not abandon proposals that the outgoing government put forward to decentralise education. Irish education must decentralise decision making if it is to achieve its full potential. Centralisation is not the answer for the future. May I conclude my few remarks here?
by again congratulating Deputy Bertie O'Hearn on being selected for the highest office that this House can bestow upon any person. I wish him exceptional good fortune in the job. He is somebody who has known both the days, the good days and the bad. He has experienced, as it is necessary for everybody to be successful <coughs> in politics, he has experienced disappointments as well as successes. And those, I believe, would have prepared him well for the task that he now undertakes. And I wish him and all those who care for him well uh, in the uh, years and months ahead. I also, may I say, wish to wish uh, you, Tom Corda, well on your appointment. I join with all those who have uh, spoken highly of you and how deserving you are of the office that you're holding now. I'd like to conclude, if I may, by coming back to just something personal I want to say. And that is that I cannot remember in my entire life, uh, two and a half years, that I have enjoyed more than the last two and a half years working with my colleagues in the Labour Party and the Democratic Left and the Fine Gael Party members in the government. Uh, it genuinely was a pleasure to work with Dick Spring and Francesca Rossa uh, it was, and with all of my other colleagues. I also want to say it was a great pleasure to work with a very highly professional public service that we have assisting all of us as ministers in our work. We're very lucky in this country to have a public service that is above suspicion in terms of any undue influence being exercised upon it. And when we add up all the reasons why Ireland is an economic success, there are many. But one of the reasons why we are an economic success is that we get investment for over, from overseas, and we wouldn't get investment from overseas were it not for the fact that everybody knows the world over that the Irish public service is above undue influence from any quarter and applies the laws of the land without fear or favour. That's a great support to any government, and it's a great guarantor of the successful future of our country. And with those words, I wish you, uh, Bertie O'Hearn, all the best. A Kahirlik is Kush Mora Stumpsa, a Shasap and Shahanu was scored the Dala Mar Hishak Anamah or Public Maharan. This more and more on Friblade of the Sundulgas at Horam, Kartu Yenever, some winter Maharan, of the Skorgon Rilthus Nuit, Shot Con Ibra, the Filonif. Count Korea want to express my deep gratitude and appreciation uh, to the Dal uh, for the very great honour they've conferred upon me in electing me Tishuk. I'm very conscious and deeply conscious of the important responsibility this honour places on me. I would like to congratulate you firstly, Count Corlea, on your election and to promise you on behalf of myself, my party and the entire government that they'll give you the fullest possible cooperation in the discharge of your duties. I wish you a, a long and happy stay. Uh, I, over the years we've talked about fathers of the house and whatever about the, uh, the, the title of it. Uh, this time I think you can stand as the true father of the house because nobody's within four years of you. Uh, we've argued here before about uh, who was uh, uh, first elected on various elections, but I suppose it's a time, it's a sign of the times that things change, uh, that from the class of 61 uh, you stand alone. And I hope uh, at a relatively young age, uh, which I, I won't mention, uh, that you can last around here for an awful long, long time. And I wish you well on that. Count Coyle, I can hear a lot of talk to all the distinguished visitors. It's my honour uh, to stand here this evening at the commencement of the 28th Dáil as the person nominated to be Taoiseach Naharan. I'm conscious of that honour and the privilege and the responsibility placed on me uh, to lead this partnership government of Fianna Fáil and the Progressive Democrats into a comprehensive government programme which will address the great challenges which face our nation at this time. I think all of those challenges have been uh, well aired today by a number of speakers and uh, challenges where I think we all understand uh, what we have to do uh, for the ordinary people of this country uh, because we're all elected in this house by the ordinary people of this country and to work for them in the years ahead. Progressive Democratic leader Mary Harney uh, TD and our government team and I will work long and hard 
Concordia to the very best of our ability and to provide sound, stable and productive government for this country. We'll concentrate on the primary needs and concerns of the nation at home and abroad. And many of the best governments in this country have been minority governments. And this will be the first to be both a minority government and a coalition. The situation will require the incoming government to pay particular attention to views expressed in this House of wherever they come from. And we will try to work constructively with other parties and, of course, independent members wherever possible. And there's a duty on all of us as Tatidala to have a dull function effectively in the interests of the people uh, for the full length of its natural term or as near as is possible to that. I would like to thank the Taoiseach for uh, his kind remarks today. Uh, that's important to me, Taoiseach. I, uh, thank you for uh, the phone conversation earlier. I want to thank you for the, uh, the way that both of us uh, were able to work during the campaign when outside face was that we were uh, totally hostile fighting our causes. Uh, but whenever we met, it was very courtesy, and I appreciate that. <coughs> I'd like to thank you especially for the assistance and the briefing uh, that you've afforded us uh, and authorised for us. Um, provided to myself and a number of colleagues uh, during the three-week interregnum, especially in relation to Northern Ireland, uh, the budgetary matters, and of course uh, the many contacts we had on the European Council uh, summit in Amsterdam. Uh, the last all was unique in that for the first time, Count Coyle, it was a change of government uh, without a general election, and uh, not something I would wish to see repeated in the near future. <laughs> uh, but it is healthy for our democracy that all the larger parties have now had an experience of governments, and many of the smaller ones too, and of working together in different combinations over the past 10 years. Uh, I believe that's been good for this House. Uh, I came in here in another period when it was kind of black and white, and uh, us and them. And, uh, but I think that's changed around, and I think that's been uh, useful uh, for, for this House. Uh, the Taoiseach and his colleagues have every right, Count Corlea, to look back with satisfaction and pride and many aspects of their stewardship during their comparatively short but still a lengthy period of two and a half years. In actual fact, I think the uh, term of office since the foundation of the state uh, over all dolls is only about two years, eight months. Uh, and needless to say, I don't intend uh, to keep within that period either. It'll be far longer than that. But uh, Tisha, I want to genuinely take this opportunity to acknowledge our work done by you and your colleagues. Uh, the Irish Presidency of the European Union Council was handled with great efficiency and professionalism. I said that at the end of that, and I meant it. Uh, Ireland's essential interests in Europe have been well defended by and large in the negotiations of the Amsterdam Treaty, uh, which we'll have to bring to the people for ratification and debate uh, here in the House, on the, as the Taoiseach, uh, outgoing Taoiseach has stated, uh, on the, the report on the summit. And while the breakdown in the uh, ceasefire was a serious setback, useful rules and structures and guidelines have been put in place by the outgoing government to advance the peace process. And the new procedures for dealing with decommissioning announced yesterday should prove, I hope, to be a most positive step towards inclusive all-party talks. Uh, throughout the last five years, uh, the Tánaiste and his department have played a particular special and important role spanning two governments and um, providing a continuity. And that deserves a proper acknowledgement, and I wish to do that. Uh, a new start has been made in tackling crime, and particularly since the tragic murder which has been mentioned by so many people here today on the anniversary of Veronica Guerin. Uh, the work must be carried on to the next stage in a coordinated and comprehensive way. And the battle against crime, I'm sure, will have to go on through the lives of many uh, dolls in the future, uh, but on it must go uh, to give safety and security uh, to the citizens of this country. The leaders of the Rainbow Coalition, the Taoiseach and the Tánaiste, Minister of Finance, Minister of Social Welfare and others have by and large served the country with great distinction and to the best of their ability and I congratulate them on uh, what they have achieved in completing their term. It can be reasonably said that the Rainbow Coalition uh, did not so much lose the election, it was more a case of the opposition winning it and it does show that solid and constructive work in bringing forward well considered and relevant policy positions and private member bills can provide a good preparation for government and make this doll uh, an interesting place for all to work. The Taoiseach and I uh, both know, and uh, he has uh, mentioned it, uh, that uh, we're from the school of politics of understanding hard knocks, uh, the ups and downs, uh, the almost theirs, and uh, the good days and the bad days. And I think it uh, feels, you know, and I know Taoiseach, what it's like to have the cup 
dash from one's lips at short notice, uh, but more importantly, how to survive, uh, and that's important, and not to take it too uh, serious at times, and to live from the experience and learn from it in a reasonably constructive frame of mind. Uh, I've had to do that, and I agree with you. I think I am a better person uh, for it. It's important, I think, that the Taoiseach of the day and the leader of the opposition should have a professional relationship and I should be able, when the national interest demands it, to close ranks and cooperate. Uh, an example, uh, the last stall was when uh, the IRA ceasefire broke down. Uh, on that night, you and I had many discussions, many discussions on that weekend. And I'd like to, to thank you for the courtesy that you've afforded me during my uh, period in office, the full period from this side of the House. I hope that we'll be able to, to continue that in the same spirit, and not just with the leader of Gael, but with the leader of other parties. I think it is essential uh, for the good order of this House. Uh, of course, it does not diminish any necessary parliamentary vigour uh, on either side, and that's part of our duties. I want to thank the members of my own party, Count Corley, and the members of the parliamentary party and of our organisation to the country uh, for the great honour they did in supporting uh, me and asking their colleagues and their elected representatives uh, to uh, nominate me uh, for the High Office of Teacher. And my sincere thanks to my partners uh, in the new government, the Progressive Democrats. Uh, I want to thank Mary Harney for uh, all of the work uh, during uh, the last number of weeks. Uh, many I understand well uh, were difficult for her. But as far as our negotiating work and the efficiency of uh, how we brought this programme together, uh, it was, I think, extremely successful. And I want to thank uh, Mary Harney and all the Progressive Democrats for their cooperation in that. I want to express my thanks to the independent members of this House, elected by the people of Ireland, who have supported my nomination today. I greatly appreciate uh, that support. I just want to assure uh, the wider public uh, that uh, I have an honour that's only been bestowed on a handful of people, or maybe two handfuls of people in this country. It carries responsibility. Uh, it carries, uh, I think, uh, a job that somebody must work extremely hard at. I like working hard, but uh, this one is a harder job than any other one. And I look forward to doing that. And I look forward to their cooperation and the cooperation of every single member of this House. Uh, the respect, the comments that have been made to me uh, over the last number of years is uh, something I appreciate. I look forward to representing this House and uh, the capacity as teacher of the country and of the people to the very best of my ability. Uh, having spent 20 years here, have not an interest in politics from a very young age. Uh, it is an honour that is as hard to put into words, Ken Corley, but an honour uh, it really is. And the only way I can return uh, that is to work day in, every hour of every day, uh, to show that I merit it. I do that on behalf of my party, uh, the Dáil, and the people of the country. Uh, can I thank uh, everyone uh, for the faith and the confidence given to me? Can I thank my family? my extended family and my friends uh, who've worked with me uh, for two decades uh, to stay in this house. And can I lastly congratulate every member elected, and particularly the new members. It is a huge honour for them. Uh, people worked extremely hard to get them into this house. It is, for many of them, they believe the pinnacle of their career. But there are people here today that will go on, who have been elected today, who will go on perhaps to hold the position I've been elected to. Uh, people here today will be ministers, ministers of state in the future, leaders of opposition and other positions. I want to wish them well at the outset of their career and hope that they uh, follow the great dignity uh, that is uh, in, in part of being a member of this House. Uh, Count Corder, uh, I've uh, been asked, as I understood, it's been agreed that the House should now adjourn um, until uh, 7.30 uh, and that the House uh, should uh, sit not later uh, than 10 p.m. tonight. I understand that's been agreed. Uh, finally, I count call you to thank everybody and to say I look forward with all the vigour and energy I can give to doing a good job as Taoiseach of this country.
the arrangement proposed by the Taoiseach designate for the suspension of the sitting and the late sitting agreed. Agreed. In accordance with precedent, when the doll resumes, members on my left shall take their seats on my right. <laughs> And members on my right shall take their seats on my left. Anish ta on si ar fionyru ri kodi lahur teresha shot. Sitting is suspended until 7.30 p.m. Now the announcement of the new government ministers in Ireland. After being selected Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern announced his government to the Doyle in Dublin. Opposition leaders then reacted to the announcement. The session's about 50 minutes. I wish to announce for the information of the Dáil that I have informed the President that the Dáil has nominated me to be the Taoiseach and that she has accordingly. I move, Count Corlea, that Dáil Éireann approve the nomination by the Taoiseach of the following deputies for appointment by the President to be members of the Government. Murray Harney, I also propose to nominate her as Tánaiste. Michael Woods, Ray Burke, Murray O'Rourke, David Andrews, Joe Walsh, Charlie McCreevy, Brian Cowan, Dermot O'Hearn, Sheila Nevalera, John O'Donoghue, Jim McDade, and Michal Martin. It has been the practice at this stage to indicate the departments to which members of the government will be assigned. I propose using the old department structure that we can call you to assign the Department of Enterprise and Employment to Mary Harney, the Department of Marine to Michael Woods, the Department of Foreign Affairs to Ray Burke, the Department of Transport, Energy and Communications to Mary O'Rourke, the Department of Fence to David Andrews, the Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry to Joe Walsh, the Department of Finance to Charlie McCreevy, the Department of Health to Brian Cowan, the Department of Environment to Noel Dempsey, the Department of Social Welfare to Dermot O'Hearn, the Department of Arts, Culture and the Gaelic to Sheila de Valera, Department of Justice and the Department of Quality and Law Reform to John O'Donoghue, the Department of Tourism and Trade to Jim McDay, the Department of Education to Michal Martin. I also, I also propose to nominate Deputy Seamus Brennan for appointment by the Government as Minister of State of the Department of Teacher with special responsibility as Government Chief Whip. He will also be Minister of State of the Department of Defence. I propose to nominate Deputy Bobby Malai for appointment as Minister of State to the Government and Minister of State of the Department of Environment. My attention that he would attend government meetings in the same way as the Chief Whip uh, does. Count Coyle, the seven of my uh, 14 nominees have uh, not been part of a, a cabinet or have never been uh, in uh, the cabinet before. Uh, and I personally want to wish all of them, including uh, the half of them who have never been there, uh, every success in the future. I propose to nominate Mr. David Byrne, Senior Counsel for Appointment by the President to be the Attorney General. I propose the other Minister of State for Appointment by the, the Government at an early date next week. I have allocated the members of the Government to the Department on the basis of existing divisions of responsibility. There are, however, substantial changes which I propose to make in departmental responsibilities and organisation to reflect or to emphasise new priorities in Government and in line with the position and policy papers which we put before the people in the recent election. The full details of these changes will be worked out over the coming days with the various officials. 
I propose to return trade to the Department of Enterprise and Development, with which it is more logically fits. Foreign trade is the lifeblood of our economy and is inseparable from the companies engaged in industry and commerce and essentially reuniting functions that naturally belong together. I will be broadening the title and the remit of health so that it becomes the Department of Health and Children. The full implementation of childcare legislation is very important to priority and this will be reflected in the description of the Department's responsibilities. I acknowledge the significant advances made during Deputy Curry's tenure of responsibility. The Minister for Social Welfare will become the Minister for Social, Community and Family Affairs. The broader remit will reflect the fact that social inclusion means more than just income support, vital though that may be. Working with voluntary and community organisations can make a lot of difference to improving opportunities for self-help and for employment in the more disadvantaged areas. The family unit is the foundation of social cohesion and needs to be supported at a policy level. The implications of decisions for the family need to be taken into account at the Cabinet table. And in, in our view, uh, the opportunity uh, to have community and family affairs and to deal with the various issues of social inclusion uh, can be best done uh, with the old Department of Social Welfare, uh, now revamped uh, with this remit. The Department of Transport, Energy and Communications has become de facto responsible for most of our larger commercial semi-state companies and for much of the state's direct involvement in the economy. I propose to recognise this explicitly by renaming the department and establishing it as the Department of Public Enterprise. This will have the benefit of underlying our commitment to a dynamic state sector. In the words of our programme, we intend to enable them to be competitive and cost-effective as providers of vital public services and of the consumer. I believe this innovation will provide important and welcome recognition and encouragement to all those who work in the commercial public sector, which includes some of the country's best companies. It may be objected that some of the responsibilities of the existing departments, such as some parts of telecommunications, mainly involve the private sector. That may be true, but it is the state or some delegated public authority on its behalf that issues the licenses, as the wavelengths are in the first instance the property of the state. Public enterprise should be understood not only to include the public sector, but all those fields of enterprise that are allocated by the public domain for private sector operation. I'm making an alteration to the Department of Arts, Culture and the Gaeltacht and proposing to rename it the Department of Arts, Heritage, Gaeltacht and the Islands. Within the departments, the Gaeltacht and the Islands will preserve their separate identity and will be giving a Minister of State responsibility for them. The arts in this state progressed from benign neglect to enlightened culture and patronage in the days when Charles Hodge was teacher and to the systematic organisation under a government department carrying full cabinet rank. I would like to acknowledge the important pioneering contribution by Deputy Michael D. Higgins as the first such minister, even if some of our priorities may be different. I regard heritage as a very important ingredient in the new department, which I would like to highlight and upgrade. It's about fostering our cultural identity, both for our own benefit and for the benefit of those who visit our shores in search of the features that are distinctively Irish. Some of our islands have in the past been badly neglected. The inhabitants have particular needs which have to be met if we wish to see the islands continue to support the critical mass of population to provide essential services. The islands are an important facet of our cultural identity and I do not think any of us should be grudged the measures which are not particularly costly in overall terms that would prevent further depopulation. The Department of Equality and Law Reform had responsibility for the, pass for the passage of the divorce referendum and the accompanying legislation, and also for equality legislation that will have to be revisited following judgments of the Supreme Court. I would like to reiterate my tribute to the work of the now retired Deputy Mervyn Taylor as a minister for whom we all had great respect. Uh, my view, however, is that law reform is a complement to law enforcement and belongs with the Department of Justice, and their function should include equality, or put another way, prohibition of discrimination. <coughs> The function of equality in law reform should be highlighted rather than subordinated, and therefore I'm expanding the remit of the Minister of the Department, calling it the Department of Justice, Equality and Law Reform. Science and technology were given a new political impetus when Fianna Fáil returned to government in 1987, which it has tended to lose gradually in the 1990s, notwithstanding the best efforts of Deputy Pat Rabbit and predecessors. While applied technology is part of industrial development, 
teaching, training, and a lot of important research takes place in the universities and colleges and clearly belongs with the educational remit. Continuing expansion will require us to meet the educational training and research needs of new industries setting up in Ireland and the Minister for Education, Science and Technology will need to liaison closely with the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment who will continue to handle the industrial research side of Furbert. Uh, Ireland needs to be at the cutting edge of scientific advance as we draw level with other countries in terms of living standards and science and research does need more priority in terms of resources and for the first time we are raising it to full cabinet level. And could I just say, Cam Foyle, it would be the responsibility uh, of a, a Minister of State. So Minister of State uh, in the Department of uh, Education will uh, have the total remit of science and technology uh, and will also uh, cooperate and uh, coordinate whatever activities are necessary uh, with uh, the Department uh, of Enterprise uh, and Employment and Trade. And continuing to combine agriculture and food uh, to emphasise that our agri-food industry needs to be market and consumer driven, not just production driven. However, as indicated in our programme for government, so as to ensure full confidence in the quality of our food from a health point of view, responsibility for a statutory independent science-based food safety and quality authority will be placed under the Department of Health and Children. I'm creating a new Department of Natural Resources, which will include mining, marine and forestry. The Department of the Environment will add rural development to its name and its responsibilities, which will also include Western development. There's a great need for rural development to maintain the fabric of rural life and the population to underpin the provision of vital services. And as a, and as a party, Fianna Fáil published a detailed policy discussion document setting out what is required. There will also be a new Department of Tourism, Sport and Recreation, to which I also propose to transfer, transfer responsibility for local development subject to further consideration and consultation. Sport has for the first time been given full cabinet status. I feel strongly that sport has the same importance for national well-being as, for example, arts and culture. Recent successes has given us an international profile, which is also helpful to the promotion of our tourism industry. And tourism, of course, is now one of the country's largest employers. Again, Count Corley, can I say that uh, the uh, issues that we raised in the broader remiss of sport and recreation and its uh, related advantages of uh, helping a uh, disadvantage and helping uh, people in less off uh, areas of society uh, to use recreation and sport as a means of, of leisure and a means of uh, to their own personal betterment is something I feel very strongly about. We're not just talking about elite sports people who so spend some time to get all of the, uh, the, the comments. We're talking about sport in its broad uh, remit of giving people an opportunity of fulfilling uh, their endeavours in life. The Minister of Defence will, in addition to its normal responsibilities, have responsibility under the direction of the Minister for Foreign Affairs for European Affairs. Modern Ministers for Foreign Affairs have a heavy schedule of meetings in relation to Northern Ireland, Europe and internationally. The Minister for Foreign Affairs needs to be able to share the burden of attending numerous important meetings without loss of function or overall policy direction with another colleague of Cabinet level. The Minister of Defence and European Affairs will not be removing any function uh, from Foreign Affairs, but will have a second office but will be sharing in the work. I also envisage that he will assist the Minister for Foreign Affairs in representing the government at the Northern Peace Talks so that there's less need to rotate attendance and multiply the number of ministers that have to be briefed. This is an issue that, as I know, uh, Deputy Bruton, as leader of the opposition, uh, would know that many, many people involved in uh, the talks process want to see the same individuals and the same people are fully involved. I believe this is a way of where we can endeavour uh, to try uh, to, to succeed in doing that. Our action programme has been published and we will form the basis of a working government. Much of the detail, however, is contained in our respective manifestos, our joint statements during the election, the background policy discussion documents, our priorities coming into government are clear. Restoring peace in Northern Ireland, diffusing conflict, making progress towards a settlement with the new British government and the parties is a vital priority. I will at all times safeguard the democracy and give leadership to the Irish nation as we try to build confidence, reconciliation, trust and cooperation between all the people on this island, if at all possible on an inclusive basis. There is now a real opportunity for peace and for progress 
towards a political settlement, which I hope will be promoted and facilitated by all parties. I will contribute with the British Government in providing the necessary momentum. I will try to help defuse confrontation so that we get away from the destructive zero-sum politics of the past, from which in practice everyone loses, to a politics from which uh, everyone can gain. I would like to be judged by an improvement in human and community relations during my period in office and the ability to move on to a less contentious and more productive agenda. To borrow a phrase, if I can help to make Northern Ireland a kind and gentler place over the next five years, I will be well placed and well pleased. My government will seek to maintain rapid economic progress and to increase employment and living standards in continuing cooperation with the social partners. We believe that tighter economic management is needed to safeguard the gains of recent years and to maximise further growth, and it will pay dividends for all. We need to correct to the course so that the present dynamism in the Irish economy does not go off the rails. We will show political responsibility at all times. We need to make a safe and careful transition into monetary, monetary union and to provide for the eventuality of some tapering off of EU funding. We would also like to be judged equally on our ability to make major inroads into poverty, disadvantage, social exclusion and long-term unemployment. Reducing the grip that drugs addiction and violent crime have on certain parts of the community will be an integral part of that program. If the fall and the progressive Democrats come to office with the most comprehensive, far-reaching, progressive environmental policies ever put forward by parties coming into government, they're integrated into all our other policies. Those who share a commitment to green policies, uh, I think, should uh, look and see what we're endeavouring to do. We intend to implement those policies in a way that will transform habits and attitudes. We hope to make Count Coyle the next five years a period of exciting national progress, building on all that has been achieved by successive governments over the past 10 years since 1987. We look forward to active and constructive engagement with the Dáil in our work. And can I finally uh, ask Count Coyle? If I can finally, uh, in moving the procedural motion, I move that one, that the proceedings on number five should be brought to conclusion, not later than 9.45 tonight, but one question, which will be put from the chair, the following arrangements shall apply. One, the speech of the Taoiseach and of every leader of a party recognised a group shall not exceed 15 minutes in each case. Two, that the speech of each other party called upon shall not exceed 15 minutes in each case. And thirdly, members may share time. And secondly, that on the conclusion of business tonight, the Dáil shall adjourn forthwith to 2.30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 9th of July. And that thirdly, that until the Dáil shall otherwise order, the order in which questions to members of the government other than that of the Taoiseach shall be asked in accordance with Standing Order 36-2 shall be that in which the members of the government will be listed in a resolution of approving their nomination by the Taoiseach for appointment by the President. Count Collier, I uh, commend the new uh, government to the Dáil. I want to uh, wish uh, all of my colleagues um, uh, every success in the years ahead. Remarkable. First of all, I have to get agreement on the arrangements as proposed by the Taoiseach. These are the time arrangements. Are these arrangements agreed? Agreed. Now, we have item number five, which is the nomination of members of the government, and I call on the Leader of the Opposition, Deputy John Bruton. <coughs> With 15 minutes. Uh, Ken Paul, I'd like to start by wishing uh, the Ministers who've had their announcements, their appointments announced here today well in their task. Uh, I'd like to say that I believe that many of the appointees bring considerable ministerial experience to their work, and I also believe that some of the uh, new appointees to Cabinet Office are people who have a proven record of ability, uh, which will be of uh, benefit to them and I hope to their departments and to the country in the coming months. Obviously, it is worth making the point that uh, the Minister's concern come to office at a time of unprecedented uh, economic growth. Uh, for the last three to four years, we have had rates of growth here in Ireland that have not been equaled in the nation's history and are not being equaled by any of the other nations in Europe. Economic growth has meant that there are 120,000 more people at work 
here in Ireland than were at work here in Ireland two and a half years ago. Economic growth also means, however, that we have choices to make. There are choices that, because money is available, because options to spend that money are available, we actually are put to the test in a moral sense more severely than we might be in times of straightened circumstances. In times of straightened circumstances, there basically frequently is no choice to be made. You have to live within your means. At a time, on the other hand, where there is money available, there are choices, and real choices to be made as to which uh, desirable object you, can attract, uh, you will give the money to. I hope that uh, the government will be one which recollects fundamental human values in the way in which it spends its money. I don't agree with the policy of the present government in regard to uh, reducing tax rates. I believe that the effect of that will be to help those who are better off more than they help those that are less well off. I think that's a fundamental error that the government has made at its foundation in concentrating on reducing tax rates rather than increasing tax allowances and widening tax bans. The effect of that fundamental error will be to make this a more divided society. And I think that at every level, level of political wisdom and also at the level of uh, normal uh, human respect for other people, that is a fundamental mistake, not just a mistake in tax policy, but also a mistake in terms of what is good for the country in making a united society here. And I believe that this government is therefore, by that decision, uh, committing itself to a course that would not be ultimately in either its interests or the nation's interests. Because we do face a choice as to what sort of Ireland we're going to have in this country in the, in the years ahead. And I believe that the choice that I just referred to is one that is adverse to our long-term interests. <coughs> However, there are many uh, things that I hope will be continued, that will be continued with, uh, in, a, in, a, in a beneficial light. I have no doubt that the new government will be committed, as the outgoing gov government was, to social partnership, to working <coughs> in conjunction with the trade unions, with the employers, with the farming organisations and with all the other organisations, in a widened social partnership and working in consultation with them. I think that is very important uh, because it uh, creates um, a cement that enables us to cope with problems in a partnership fashion that might not be possible for us to, to cope with otherwise. It is important also that the House should recognise that the country faces very significant uh, challenges from outside this island. We do live in a truly global economy. As a result of decisions taken recently, uh, all markets are open to all other producers. The Irish market, as part of the European Union, is going to be open to imports of goods and services from all over the world. This is going to mean that the idea that we can protect ourselves or protect particular forms of employment or particular uh, activities from international competition is anachronistic. It isn't possible for us to do this. Therefore, there is going to be a to have to be a constant process of improvement in the way in which we are competitive in every aspect of life. We have got to recognise that the public service, our educational system, uh, our health system are as much part of the Irish competitive economy as our information technology industries or our pharmaceutical industries or our agricultural industries. Everything we do in Ireland is going to impinge on our capacity to rise relative to others or to fall relative to others in terms of uh, production and true production, our capacity to give a good living to our people. And I think it's very important that that should be understood, as I've no doubt it will be, uh, by, by the government. You also have got to recognise, however, that we are also, as a part of a global community, facing very fundamental choices. Uh, as I said in uh, this speech congratulating the Taoiseach on his appointment, uh, there are 450 million more people on this globe than were on this globe at the time of the 1992 election. By the time that a law would run its natural <laughs> term, there will be a similar increase in population yet again, and that will continue probably for success of dollar well into the beginning of the next century. There is going to be a major challenge in terms of public health and also in terms of protection of the environment from that growth in population. We see incidents of the effects of that growth in world population in the number of refugees that are seeking refuge in this country at the present time, an issue that rose considerably in the general election. We are just seeing here, in that phenomenon, evidence on our own streets of the pressure of world population 
on the res limited resources of the world. It is very important that we should bear that in mind, and in all the work that the government does in the years ahead, that it should bear in mind that we are just a small part, a rich small part, of a very big poor world, a world which faces many severe uh, challenges that we don't experience in our daily lives. And just as I believe that it's important that in the way we manage within our own society, we must act in a caring way. It is important that we act in a caring way vis-a-vis -vis the wider world and that we exercise our responsibilities fully in that matter. I would like now, if I may, in the few moments that remain to me, Karen Corla, on this occasion to address some of the uh, changes that have been announced uh, by the Taoiseach here in his speech. Um, I find a number of things that I don't believe are easily explicable. For example, the Taoiseach has announced that he intends to have a Department of Health and Children, and then he intends to have a separate Department of Social, Community and Family Affairs. In other words, he's separating responsibility from the family and responsibility for children. I can't understand the concept that separates responsibility for children from responsibility for the family. It doesn't seem to me that that's been taught out at all. It seems to me very foolish indeed to separate responsibility for children from responsibility for the family. I also think that it's quite surprising, and I think that we may be engaged here in a simply in an activity that could be known as cosmetics, insofar as we're simply adding titles to people without any substance behind those titles. What additional responsibilities has the Minister for Social Welfare been given to enable he, uh, that minister to have responsibility for family affairs in a meaningful way? We haven't been told that. Why is, as I say, responsibility for children be kept separate? We're also told that the Minister for Social Welfare will be responsible for social, community and family affairs. And yet, the most important contribution that the state makes to community development is through the local development scheme that was pioneered by my predecessor and which I continued. And yet, although the Minister for Social Welfare is now to be also the Minister for Community Affairs, the, the, part, the responsibility for local development has been transferred to an entirely different minister, the Minister for Tourism. What sense is there in making the, the Minister for Social Welfare responsible for community affairs if local development is transferred to an entirely different minister? Again, I don't think this has been thought out at all. I also find the decision to rechristen the Department of Transport, Energy and Communications, the, response of the Department of Public Enterprise, very difficult to understand. To my mind, the function of Department of Transport and Communications is to provide transport and communications for people, for consumers. The orientation of that department should be on the consumers of the services and on the particular services to be provided, not on the legal format of the services themselves. And by christening the department, the Department of Public Enterprise, it seems to me that the government is more concerned with who owns the services rather than how good the services are, or whether they meet their purpose. And while I would have to say the Department of Transport, Energy and Communications was a rather cumbersome title, at least it did tell us what that department was supposed to be doing. It was supposed to be providing transport, it was supposed to be helping to provide energy, and it was supposed to be providing communications. Now all we're going to know is that it is public enterprise. What does that mean? other than to those who are employed in it. It doesn't have a meaning in terms of the consumer who is supposed to be the object of all of this. And to my mind, the approach that should be adopted in regard to all of these services that are under the Department of Transport, Energy and Communication should be to bring them closer to the consumer. And this rechristening of the department, to my mind, seems to focus back on issues of ownership rather than on issues of service to the, in the various sectors of the community that are due to be served by them. And I believe that that is a mistake, a mistake that derives from lack of thought. And one might say, well, that's entirely justifiable. The 
the Taoiseach has only had two hours between the time he was appointed and the time he came in here to announce his ministries. But that is, of course, not the case. He has been anticipating this office for the last two and a half years. He's had two and a half years to prepare. I would have thought that if he had thought about the matter a little bit more, he would have come up with a little bit more meaningful um, allocations of responsibility than he has done. I also would like to focus, focus on another matter, which I think is quite uh, serious in regard to the functioning of cabinet government. We discover, in fact, that the Minister for Defence, who is a full cabinet men minister, will be, in fact, the junior minister, as far as European affairs is concerned, to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I have never known a case in the past where a full cabinet minister was, in effect, subordinate to another full cabinet minister. The whole basis of cabinet government has been equality of the ministers concerned. And yet we have a situation now proposed wherein the Minister for Foreign Affairs will be in fact the boss of another minister at the cabinet table insofar as most of the responsibilities of that, of that other minister is concerned. Deputy Burke will be Deputy Andrews' boss for European affairs while supposedly being equal to him in other matters of cabinet deliberation. Now, to my mind, to my mind, one of the this is not this 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 is of course colourful and is no reflection in either of the personalities involved. Either one of them, the positions could be interchangeable. I'm not making any comment on either two, either either individual uh, at all. Either one of them would be quite capable of being either the equal or the superior of the other. That's not the point I'm making at all. They're both qualified to hold any office, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But it is a mistake. In my view, a serious mistake by the Taoiseach to create a situation within the cabinet where you have, in the nature of cabinet decision making, we should operate by consensus. You have two people sitting at this table, one of whom is in fact superior to the other, even though they are supposedly equal in terms of their cabinet decision making. I believe that that is a fundamental error of cabinet construction of serious consequences and a grave mistake on the part of the Taoiseach, something that he should not have done and in which I believe he has displayed inexperience that he ought not to have displayed and which is indeed surprising against the background of his very considerable ministerial experience in the past. Uh, I don't think that was a good move at all and I have to say that here and now. I won't be dwelling on it afterwards. Um, perhaps it will work. I don't believe it will. But I think the evidence of that will be seen more at the cabinet table than outside it. It is not a good idea to have cabinet ministers who are not each one the equal of the other. And the Taoiseach, by the decisions he has made here, has created inequality within the cabinet between two individuals where one of them will be the boss of the other for part of the other's work, and that's a mistake. Uh, those basically are the points I wanted to make on the, on the makeup of the government. Having said that, I wish to, uh, I wish to congratulate all concerned and wish them well in their work. Uh, they will, of course, um, be the subjects of vigilant uh, scrutiny from this side of the House, uh, from the Fine Gael party in particular, a party which has been reinvigorated by a substantial accretion of new members, a uh, very substantial increase in new members, a party which has seen its vote increase, unlike the parties who have gone into office. The parties who have gone into office have either seen their votes stagnate or fall, the Fine Gael party has seen its vote rise. And we have risen also in confidence, we have risen also in vigilance and inability and deputy power. We're looking forward to a return to office whenever you fall. <laughs>
Let me also, I would like also to pay tribute to some deputies who lost out in the last election in what is a very difficult business. I've lost a number of very close colleagues uh, in the election, friends indeed, and I would like to record my appreciation of their work uh, in, over the last four years and the work of members who have not returned, in particular many hard-working deputies did not return after this election. Indeed, some cases, uh, ministers and ministers of state lost their seats. And I wish to record my thanks and my appreciation for their outstanding service. They, they all work very hard on behalf of my party and on behalf of the people that they represented. And I also look forward to the day when they will have an opportunity, as happens, and there are many members here today who have been out of the House and have come back again uh, by reason of their interest in the communities and working, continuing to work. Now, let me also offer my genuine congratulations to every member of the new Cabinet. Uh, I have to say I am pleased to see that there are three women in the Cabinet. I applaud that decision and I welcome and I wish each of them every success. Uh, I want to also say to you all that you are people of high calibre, taking on an enormous challenge at an interesting time, and we wish you well. And uh, I'm sure that you will all bring your considerable talents, talents to bear uh, to the jobs that you have been given. Let me say to you that from our point of view, that we intend to give you and to provide strong and effective opposition. That is our function. Uh, we are, if I may say on behalf of the Labour Party, we are the oldest democratic party in this state and we have a proud and independent tradition. Uh, there have been times in the history of this House when indeed Labour on our own provided the opposition and that, I'm not talking about recent years, <laughs> but we have never, never seen any shame or disgrace in performing the work that we are given and in performing the work of opposition deputies, and we look forward to marking the government day in and day out. Now, I do promise that, and I can say this as a Taoiseach, uh, that our opposition will be vigilant. Uh, it will be total, it will be constructive. Uh, it will be based on policy and principle, and not on personalities or on name calling. It will be on policy and principle. And we will harry and pursue the government about economic and social policy, and we will demand and expect the highest standards of accountability from the government. Uh, we intend to ensure that the government keeps its promises and carries, out, carries on the work of building an inclusive and tolerant society. And we will attack lip service and will frankly acknowledge uh, achievement when achievement is, is, is uh, deserved. Now, let me just say to the Taoiseach in relation to the actual um, composition of the cabinet, I, I have to say that uh, I think it is lacking in thought or imagination, as the Deputy Bruton said, you did have quite some time to prepare this. But you have, in, by and large, selected people uh, who have given many hostages to fortune, if I may say so, when they were on the opposition benches, and they should come back to haunt them. Uh, they will require careful and detailed scrutiny in the light of their explicit record and everything they said over the last two and a half years. Uh, of course, I think you have also, I'm not sure whether this was deliberate or otherwise, but you have indeed ignored many parts of the country. Uh, the entire southeast of Ireland, County Tipperary North and South, uh, Limerick City and County uh, are completely neglected. Uh, more or less the entire northwest of the country is not represented in the cabinet. Uh, but also, if I may say, he's so far, he's so far north and west, you'll almost miss him. I congratulate Deputy McDaid on his appointment. Now, let me, let me, let me also say to you that um, your program for government uh, places a heavy emphasis on inclusion and social disadvantage, as it should be. But I, I have to say to you that I am particularly disappointed that you're not going to have a Department of Equality in law reform. I want to say to you that very genuinely in relation to what's been done. And I acknowledge what you said in relation to Minister Mervyn Taylor, former Minister Mervyn Taylor. But I have to say to you that no fine words or cosmetic exercises can disguise the fact uh, that I believe you are setting back the cause of people with disability in that decision. And I regret that very, very fundamentally. And also there are many groups already who got recognition in the last four years on the margins of society. And I think they will realize that. And I think it is sad, and I think that it's a decision that you will come to regret. And I'm not sure how you're going to reassure those people with disability uh, in relation to abolishing that department. I, I do not see it fitting, with all due respects, and I have tremendous respect for my county colleague, John O'Donoghue, I do not see it fitting in with your priorities in the Department of Justice. I think it's a fundamental mistake, and it's one I would ask you to revisit, if that's possible. Uh, we have given those people a voice in the last number of years, and I think you're taking that away. People with disability are not sick people. Uh, they do not need to be represented by a junior minister of the Department of Health. Uh, they are people who have been discriminated against in the past, and they will never, never adequately be represented by the Department of Justice in its present format. And I would ask you, teacher, to revisit that decision. Now, people with disabilities are people 
against whom society has built barriers. Much work has been done the past number of years in empowering people with disability to tear down those barriers. And I believe that most members of this House are genuinely supportive of the efforts of the last number of years. But you have weakened that empowerment and you've created yet one more barrier for those people to climb. And I regret that. I don't think that anything that can be said or done now would undo that. I think that is very regrettable. Also, the silence, your silence on the Equal Status Bill and the Employment Equality Bill, I have to say I also see as an indication that people who have suffered discrimination in the past must now wait a long time for redress. I am worried about the, and I congratulate uh, Deputy de Valera in her elevation to high office, uh, but I am worried about that department in terms of we have had success, and again, graciously teach you acknowledge the success of my colleague Michael D. Higgins. But I am worried that the cultural industries, which we have given so much stimulus to in the recent years, will be lost out in the present format. But perhaps you'll have an opportunity to explain uh, the change in that department, uh, where's broadcasting going, for example, and other aspects of that department. But I have to say that one decision absolutely astounds me. It was referred to by Deputy Bruno. And this has nothing to do with Deputy Burke or Deputy Andrews as individuals. They are both strong-willed and able politicians. But I have to say to you that you may inform us whether or not you're going to bring in legislation, because I do not think that you can constitutionally have, to have a minister of the cabinet subordinate to another minister of the same cabinet. I do not think that will actually work. I haven't access to the 1924 Minister and Secretaries Act right now. I will have before the first question time in this House. And I have to say to you, I think that you have a legislative problem. You will have to bring in legislation if you're going to have Minister Andrews as the Minister of Defence operating within the Department of Foreign Affairs, subordinate to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Burke, whom I congratulate in been going back to that department. Uh, I think it is certainly illegal under our present legislative framework and it will require an amendment to the Minister and Secretaries Act. Perhaps, Taoiseach, you will inform the House if that's what you have in mind. Uh, because otherwise, I do not think that you can have a minister. Uh, because, as you are well aware from your experience of government, members of the Cabinet are collectively responsible uh, to one another. Collectively responsible to one another, not one minister being subordinate to another minister. And departments of state are given special functions by law, and those, de those functions are vested in the minister uh, appointed as head of the department. Uh, so I hope that ultimately when the route takes place in that gracious building on the other side of uh, Stevens Green that the Minister for Defence doesn't decide to bring all his tanks just to convince <laughs> the Minister for Foreign Affairs that he wants to win the point. But I make the more serious point, and I think we have a serious constitutional problem if you're going to see this through, because functions given under the Minister and Secretary's Act cannot be carried out under the direction of two different ministers. And that is a serious and fundamental problem in relation to... Now, if you want to create a Department of European Affairs, uh, then it must be, you must assign responsibility to the minister in charge of that department. And that is perhaps, but perhaps uh, Deputies Andrews and Burke will work that out between themselves in their inimitable style. Now, in analysing time, uh, the promises made by the government, uh, I have to say that I'm struck by the vagueness uh, of many, uh, of most of which they've been expressed in your programme. I'm particularly struck by the section that purports to outline seven key concerns of the people. The issues of jobs and employment did not merit a heading on its own, and indeed is barely mentioned throughout the entire document. And one has to wonder at the government that regards reductions in the top rate of tax, about which I will say more in a moment, as being of more importance than the continuing crisis of unemployment, which still affects far too many families in our community. Uh, I have to say there are many parts of the document I found myself wondering whether the vagueness is designed to conceal uh, a more fundamental intention. And I've mentioned one particular example, and the teacher might like to explain this just before 10 o'clock tonight. On page 10 of the programme for government, there is the following, I have to say it's, it's rather innocuous in the way it's expressed, but there's a commitment. The utilisation of the tax system, including capital taxation, to encourage entrepreneurship. Now, I, I just, teach, I, I really wonder what does this mean. Uh, the teacher would be well aware, and I'm not sure that Deputy Harney is, uh, that a small number of wealthy individuals in Ireland, uh, one of whom is the proprietor of a near monopoly uh, of the media industry, they have used their political access in the past to try to secure a cash ceiling on the amount of capital acquisitions tax that would be paid by any one individual. The case was made to me at the time that such an idea would be just the kind of thing that would attract wealthy entrepreneurs uh, to come and live in Ireland and the other homegrown entrepreneurs to spend their declining years here. Uh, with untold and indeed unspecified advantages for the Irish economy. 
Ever since I rejected that proposal, I have to say I've had the uneasy feeling that I may have lost friends in some section of the media. But in any event, I can find no parallel references. Uh, just, just listen to it now for a second. I've listened to you guys for the last four years. I can find no, and perhaps the teacher might like to elaborate, but I can find no parallel references to this commitment in the election manifestos of either the Fianna Fáil party or the Progressive Democrats, and no explanation as to what it might be intended to mean. Uh, no doubt this is a subject which we can indeed, I'm sure, return on question time, perhaps, if the teacher doesn't want to clarify it before 10 o'clock this evening. But in the end, the government will be judged on the degree to which it has protected and embellished the fabric it is, has, has been given. I do not say that in any grudging way, but I believe that it is necessary to speak about one, the two, one or two of the crucial issues uh, that are lie ahead and which this government has inherited a sound foundation to build on. Northern Ireland, if I may speak briefly on it, uh, the previous government carried through the work of peace building in every way possible. Uh, Deputy Harney was kind enough to pay tribute to that earlier this afternoon. It does remain a task unfinished. There's one organisation to blame for any lack of progress, I believe, and, that's, and there's only one. That organisation is the IRA. Uh, when the new government takes office, it will find a team of public servants, the best, I believe, in the world, ready to assist them with the work of peace building. It will find a set of documents which contain the outline of a fair and lasting settlement of the problem. It will find ground rules laid down and broadly agreed for the conduct of negotiations. It will find solutions already broadly agreed for the intractable problem of decommissioning. It will find strong and supportive international relationships. It will find an Anglo-Irish relationship that is as good as it could possibly be with a British government strongly committed to progress. And it will find an IRA that still lacks the vision and the foresight to allow its political wing to join the negotiations. And as one who all through my political career have worked for the most inclusive process possible, I say this, don't give up on inclusion. They would never allow a veto to the IRA. They can never be allowed to believe that they can bomb their way to the negotiating table. Here, here, here. And it is they and no one else who prevent Sinn Féin and the people that Sinn Féin represent from taking part in negotiations. I call this government and I do so with confidence, having regard to the broad support you gave to us, never to give in to the bomb and the bullet or the threat of our violence in the peace process. And I call this government to get stuck in immediately to the work of peace building and to do it without fear or favour. You may well find, as some of us have, some of us have had, that your efforts are not appreciated by some on the Unionist side of the debate. That ought not to matter. No one should have a veto on reasonable progress. And no one will if you're sufficiently resolute and if your actions are dictated by established principles. One of those principles, I believe, is that no settlement can last if the process excludes any significant element of the community. For that reason, I hope you will be, that you will be given the opportunity of an IRA ceasefire, which would enable Sinn Féin to enter the process for good and all. If there is any assistance, I or my party, and I'm sure other colleagues and former government can give, it will be given and it will be constructive. Uh, the second issue I wish to address is the economy and the various promises made by the incoming government. I have to say to you that you cannot do what you have promised over the last number of months. You must, I believe, have known that when you were drawing up your program for government, you will have choices to make and they will not be easy ones. You have an obligation to this House to tell us as soon as possible whether you're going to choose between greed or inclusion. You have an obligation to tell us as soon as possible in what areas of public spending you are going to make cuts in order to make the targets set by Deputy McCreevy in his radio interview last Sunday. And I have to promise you this, if I see the slightest return of the days when education, health and housing services bore the brunt of all cutbacks, we will fight you every step of the way in this House. There is no doubt in my mind that these are the kind of choices you will have to make if you are to honour the excessive tax promises that you have made and you will meet stern opposition in this House. The tax package that you have agreed, if you implement it, it will skew almost all benefits towards the better off and it will widen the gap between families on low and moderate incomes on the one hand and families in higher incomes on the other. There is simply no case for going as far and as fast as you propose to go and even a less, less a case for making those who depend on state services bear the cost of those promises. You talk in your programme of government about making an all-out assault and a disadvantage. And I have no doubt about the sincerity of those intentions. But many of the elements in your programme will have the opposite effect and I urge a major rethink before the budget in the autumn. On an occasion like this, one could indeed talk about a long time about issues of personalities. I do not intend to do so, because by and large, I, this is an occasion of congratulations. You have won the election. Uh, the honour is yours, and you are, uh, I would say again, I congratulate you on behalf of everybody, on behalf of your families and those who have supported you and worked with you. And I can say to you that from my own point of view, from the Labour Party, we have rebuilding to do, and we have to regain our strength, but we will provide you with vigilant and strong opposition. 
We will dedicate ourselves to those tasks, and I certainly look forward to fighting the next election on a modern, independent platform. The interests of our community and the, our economy depend on stable government. They depend also on a government that has clear priorities and that genuinely place the interests of people before politics. And now is the time for this government to prove that that was more than an election slogan. I wish you well, Taoiseach, and I wish you well in your cabinet. I look forward to getting answers in the days and weeks ahead. Keep up with events in the United Kingdom every Sunday night on Prime Minister's Questions from the British House of Commons. Prime Minister Tony Blair responds to questions from members of his party and the opposition. You can see it at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on our